All right, welcome everyone. Um, as always, uh, I have to advise everyone that this meeting is being broadcast over the internet. Uh, so we're supposed to be conscious of our behavior because of that. Um, this morning, it's my pleasure to welcome our newest uh, board member, Heather Morris, our new student uh, board member to our meeting. Uh, Heather is a student at Texas Tech University, as you can tell by her red and black <laughs> outfit. Uh, and she has been appointed as the new um, member by the governor, replacing uh, Trey Lewis, who just left our board. So welcome, Heather. Thank you very much. You, you want to say a couple words? or? Just how very honored I am to be a part of the coordinating board membership and what an outstanding opportunity this is to represent students across the state and bring policy issues to life that are unique to students' perspectives. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Heather, and welcome. Right <clears throat> All right. Ah, and I actually did find my script. Okay. Uh, just a brief overview of today's meeting. Uh, because we have, I think, uh, an ad hoc uh, committee lunch meeting, and our, our Chairman Ryder's uh, aging back has an appointment at 1.30, uh, <laughs> our goal today... <laughs> Our goal today is to complete our agenda by noon, if at all possible, without shortcutting our discussion or any of our presentations, um, especially the master plan presentation by the Texas A&M University system on six of their campuses, in, uh, in particular also items 2G, J, and K regarding closing the gaps progress and reports on the 81st legislature and the federal stimulus, which I particularly want to give the committee time to digest. Uh, what's, what has happened to Texas here in the last few months. Uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get cracking. Next item is uh, approval of the minutes from the March 24th meeting. Any questions or discussion about the minutes? I move we approve the minutes. We have a motion second. from Dr. Phillips, second from Ms. Mendoza. All in favor say aye. Aye. Same opposed, same sign. Next agenda item is item 2C approval of the consent calendar. Um, there are two items on the consent calendar listed. Uh, note that the University of Houston's project was originally listed on the consent item, uh, but should not have been. So it has been taken off the consent agenda that you may have first received. So the uh, construct University Apartments project from Texas A&M University and the construct construction of the mid-campus parking facility from UTMD Anderson Cancer Center are our two consent agenda items. Is there any question or discussions? If not, the Chair will entertain a motion to approve. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion uh, from Ms. Mendoza and a second from Mr. Hinton. All in favor say aye. Aye. Oh, yeah, Joe, look, <coughs> got to wind that back in. You're, you're not actually a voting member of this committee, though, though a valued participant. I'm a dog. I thought, it, okay. Okay, so we have I'm a motion. not either, Joe, so don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> we have a motion from... Uh, I'm sitting here looking at the agency operation. I'd write at the top of the list. <laughs> what do you mean I'm not there? <laughs> we need a second from somebody Once else. Once again, I'll withdraw. Second. Joe withdraws his, and Brenda, second. Brenda seconds Elaine's motion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And I'll second your comments about Joe, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All of the above passes. Okay. Um, Agenda item 2B, um, as everybody will remember, we're asking each of the systems and the independent universities to come before this committee and present the overall direction for their campus and campus planning um, so that we can put the individual projects we see into the broader context of what our universities are doing. At the meeting today, the Texas A&M University System has graciously agreed to be uh, our next guinea pig. and. Uh, <coughs> They're going to do part of their, their campuses. Our largest systems will have to split this across meetings. Today we'll be hearing from Virgil Gay, who will give the system introduction, and then the following presenters will follow him. And I guess, Virgil, you're going to start, and then they'll come to the table. And yes, we will. Yes. We're going to have today Dr. Flavius Killebrew, president of Texas A&M Corpus Christi, Dr. Uh, Dominic Dotavio, president of Tarleton State. And uh, Dr. Dotavio, would you stand? Yes, sir. And the new president of Tarleton State, welcome. Dr. Ray Keck, president of Texas A&M International. Old hat, you don't have to stand. Uh, Mr. Joe Garcia, vice president for finance and administration of Texas A&M Kingsville. Mr. 
Mr. Joe Garcia here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Maria Ferrier, Executive Director. She's not with us today. Uh, okay. We have Dr. Carolyn Green. Dr. Uh, Carolyn Green. Yes, uh, Dean of Academic Affairs. Okay, He's great. With us today. And uh, <clears throat> Mr. Bob Brown, Vice President for Business and Administration at Texas A&M Commerce. That is correct. Welcome, Mr. Brown. All right, Virgil, why don't you uh, All right. get well, us good started. Good morning, and thank you for having us. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to begin sharing the visions and the goals of the A&M system and its various academic components. Uh, our system is 11 universities, seven state agencies, 109,000 plus students. Uh, our mission and vision focus on education, research, technology, and, tr and training for the people of Texas. Uh, we uh, at the a &M system speak with many voices, but we share common unified imperatives and goals. Uh, things like openness and accountability and excellence through academics and extension. Uh, research for tomorrow, and uh, resources that are optimized and leveraged. Uh, today we have six system universities here to share their individual visions and goals along with the outline of their upcoming project. We'll now go ahead and get started with uh, those, uh, those representatives of these institutions, and so we'll start with Dr. Flavius Kellebrew. Thanks, Virgil. Thank you, Virgil. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, we start uh, our presentation with uh, an aerial view of, of the island uh, campus and, and uh, the area outlined in yellow uh, on the other side of the bay is some uh, land that the city of Corpus Christi recently donated to the university because of, uh, of its growth that it's experienced over time. And you can tell from the aerial view the reason that we needed to consider that. There's not a whole lot of room left uh, in terms of places for, for building sites. And, and so we're, we're extremely pleased with that. The university is a, a growing doctoral granting institution uh, that's dedicated to excellence in research and teaching and creative activity and service. We are an HSI, we're a Hispanic serving institution. Something close to 40% of our students are Hispanic. Uh, students and because of, of uh, our proximity to the Gulf of Mexico we try very hard to focus our activities on on Gulf of Mexico research and the fact that we're on that cultural border between the South Texas and the rest of, of Texas and uh, and that Hispan Hispanic influence uh, we tried to make sure that our our uh, academic programs uh, uh, maintain excellence and and uh, we we rank uh, uh, very highly in the, in the state in terms of overall research uh, funding uh, and uh, continue to see a lot of growth in, in uh, the research funding area for the institution. Change the slide, please. I, I show you a, a chart here that shows uh, what's happened to the, to the enrollment at the institution over time and what we did was use the uh, coordinating board's uh, model for a forecast that we worked with uh, Susan Brown and her staff on for the uh, show where we'll be in the future. This last fall we were at 9,007 and you can see that the, the growth projections are, are fairly dramatic and, and indicate uh, uh, a need to, to, to continue to look at how we deploy our facilities. Next slide. Um, when, when we started looking at the the growth uh, on the island and the fact that the building sites were shrinking up, one of the decisions that was made in the ma master planning process was that we needed to focus academic programs primarily on the island and move sports complexes and things like that off of the island. We want to be sure that the students uh, have their classes and, and, uh, and are able to get back and forth to class and to research labs and that thing, sort of thing as easily as possible. One of the things that we had to move uh, in order to build the nursing and kinesiology building that's in, under construction now is our tennis uh, complex uh, that uh, serves uh, both academic and athletic purposes. And, and so we're hoping that one of the first things that we can develop a funding stream for will be uh, in a phased approach the, the tennis replacement of the tennis complex on this new land. Okay. Um, Another uh, element that, that is soon going to be an issue for us is 
with the completion of the construction of the business building that you recently approved at, uh, at uh, your, one of your meetings, uh, we will be running out of uh, uh, chiller capacity on, on the island and uh, also power. And so one of the things that we definitely need to be looking at uh, doing is an expansion of our central utility plant with the addition uh, to the building itself uh, because there is no, no additional space in the building in order to add an, any more chillers. And we need to add at least one 1,500-ton chiller uh, to that facility for, for uh, redundancy and for future growth. You'll also can tell in the picture down in the lower corner that a lot of the, uh, of the island is covered with surface parking. And one of the challenges that we need to be able to figure out is how to uh, uh, construct and, and finance a parking garage. Uh, parking garage would be a much better utilization of that surface space. And so uh, we're in the process of trying to figure out uh, how to do that particularly if we could uh, use, the, say, the first floor of the, of the parking garage as a mixed-use facility, poss possibly some ENG space or, or some other use for auxiliary functions or whatever. But uh, that's, that's a fairly high priority for us because, you know, with the kind of growth we're looking at, we will cap out in terms of uh, uh, ability to park additional individuals in a not-too-distant future. Um, the capital projects that we have on our list uh, that uh, uh, that are some of the higher priority ones. One is a life science building, and this is primarily a, a, a facility to to uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do we focus a lot on the on the fact that we're on the Gulf of Mexico. We do a lot of research with regard to. Uh, uh, the Gulf of Mexico in our marine biology area and that, and that sort of thing. It's, uh, we're running out of space for research labs and, and, uh, and, and that sort of thing to, to, uh, to be able to continue to have additional funding from research in, in that area. Uh, there, this, la this building would have a core microscopy suite, a biomedical and marine biology labs and, and, uh, and such. Uh, also, our university center was, I believe our university, current university center was completed in 1999. And uh, if you go back to that chart on our enrollment, we had, you know, about half the enrollment we do now. So our, our university center is already oversubscribed by the students in terms of uh, spaces to, to hold meetings and that sort of thing. The third item here is uh, uh, we were funded for a business incubator during the during the legislative session as a revenue neutral item, and we're working with the city of Corpus Christi on building relationships to to get this uh, incubator going. In these economic times, it's critical to try to to get uh, more uh, economic stimulation going, and our area is certainly in need of that. Uh, this incubator it would be a special use space uh, that uh, we need uh, to to house that incubator, uh, and that's uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Killebrew. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Killebrew about A and M Corpus Christi? I just say the board members who haven't been down there need to get down there and see it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful called the Island University for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Rough life. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody has to do it. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, ladies. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Detop. Is it Detavio or Detavio? Detavio. Okay. Although my father says Detavio. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. It's a great pleasure to be w with you today. Uh, we don't have an island university, but we do live in the cowboy capital of the world. There you go. Uh, I'd like to talk to you uh, in a similar fashion that, that Dr. Killebrew did uh, about the, uh, the mission and where it is that uh, our primary capital construction projects are and where we're heading. Uh, in a nutshell, the mission of Tarleton is really to prepare students to live a life of purpose uh, with distinction by providing them with the education necessary to establish successful careers while becoming success, uh, while becoming responsible citizens and leaders at the same time. Our uh, goals for the university have really centered around four 
primary items. These are reflected in our strategic plan. Uh, one is to excel in scholarship, teaching, and learning. This is uh, really what uh, the academic core of the university is about, identifying ways for us to really provide the finest quality education possible and blending that with a, an increasing research profile for the university. The second, the second one talks about expanding our horizons. This is our um, uh, effort to uh, provide global perspectives and to assure that we uh, account for the importance of diversity in the curriculum. A third is to encourage our students to be leaders, to serve, and ultimately to succeed both as students and uh, in the world at large when they graduate. Uh, much of our activity in this goal centers around the out-of-classroom uh, learning environment. We believe a great deal of learning takes place outside the 15 or so hours that they're in the classroom. And the last one talks about extending our reach, which is uh, our uh, efforts to engage our alumni in serious ways and while at the same time to uh, have what it is that we do by way of mission for Tarleton uh, reach out beyond the confines of the campus to the community to the state and, and to the nation. Tarleton, uh, I think to uh, many people, it has a surprising representation across the state. Uh, typically in any given uh, semester, we have students uh, coming from about 225 of Texas's 254 counties. Typically about um, 48 of uh, the states represented at, at Tarleton and somewhere between 25 and 30 uh, countries represented at, at the same time. Uh, our enrollment uh, it, uh, count is complicated because I think, as you know, uh, for the last number of years, uh, a major effort of Tarleton has been uh, uh, creating a freestanding university, Texas A&M Central Texas now. The governor signed that legislation several weeks ago. And so much of our effort for uh, really more than 10 years has been focused on en enrollment growth at uh, at our campus in Killeen, and, uh, and we were successful, I think, uh, as I said, in, in creating that freestanding university. That has been, quite frankly, at the expense of the Stephenville campus, and so our enrollment in Stephenville, Stephenville has been uh, uh, pretty stable. Um, however, uh, the two other pieces of those bar graphs that you see there, that bar graph that you see, uh, relates to our Southwest Metroplex, which is Fort Worth, and Waco programs. Both of these programs have been growing uh, substantially. We expect to see uh, actually increased growth in them over the last five years or so. They've been, they grew at about uh, 150, 160 percent. Um, we've, uh, this past year, focused on Stephenville as well, and we saw a 7 percent growth there, 13 uh, percent growth this coming uh, fall is what we're anticipating. So we think now that we have Central Texas where it needs to be and we can refocus energy in Stephenville, that we're going to see a, a, a moderate uh, and progressive growth in enrollment there. Our target is about 3 to 4 percent each year. Uh, this is our projection uh, uh, for uh, enrollment growth. Uh, this includes those three sites, uh, the Metroplex, Waco, and Stephenville. And the chart that I showed you before, by the way, did not include uh, Central Texas. We pulled all those numbers out. And so um, today we talk about about 9,600 students. That's with Central Texas, but that, uh, that's adjusted down to this uh, 80 some uh, 100 students uh, without Central Texas included. So uh, this is, uh, is accounting for about that 3, 4 percent growth per year. A number of uh, current and uh, prospective capital construction projects, uh, one that is just beginning uh, uh, is a central plant loop project that we believe is going to help us tremendously with regard to energy conservation. Uh, they are in the process of uh, digging those holes right now. That's about a, a $13, $14 million project, I, I believe. Second one is a nursing building. The site has been cleared. We're uh, hoping to begin construction of that here in the next couple of months with a completion date uh, of uh, December 2010. That's about a $24 million uh, project. 
uh, currently our nursing program, uh, we cannot really add any new students simply because we do not have the space uh, for them. And so this project will help us uh, meet that, uh, what you all know is a very serious need for additional nurses in the state of Texas. A dairy center, uh, an $11 million project. Uh, this one should start uh, within uh, weeks, actually. Uh, completion uh, next spring. It will provide um, uh, really the only dairy center in a multi-state uh, uh, region, uh, the only one in Texas at a university. And uh, it's a partnership, really. It's called the Southwest Regional Dairy. Uh, because it's a partnership uh, with other universities in Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas. And then finally, uh, something that our board just approved uh, last month is a new student housing complex, about 300 new beds to replace uh, some old apartments that were commercial apartments that, that we purchased uh, several decades ago and are in serious need of demolition. Uh, that's about a $13 million project. So current projects total about $65 million. We submitted uh, or had um, paper on several uh, tuition revenue bonds. You can see them listed. Uh, those total about $175 million. Our first priority really was to uh, rehabilitate, renovate some of our existing buildings. Um, most of these we're talking about uh, buildings that were constructed in the 50s or so and so in some serious need of, of rehabilitation. And then uh, we did submit a couple of stimulus projects that totaled, uh, I think, about $30 million, uh, and they certainly uh, fit the, the criteria for the stimulus projects very well. We could start these tomorrow if we had been given the, uh, the approval to do so. Uh, the Fine Arts Center built in 1980 was about a $10 million project, then additional uh, energy projects that extended that uh, loop that I had talked about. So about $30 million in, in projects there. I think the net effect of all of these is, uh, given what we're expecting in terms of enrollment growth and the like, uh, some of these will certainly help us meet those needs uh, as we go into the, into the future. I'd be happy to answer any questions for you. Any questions regarding uh, Tarleton State? Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Keck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, committee members. Good morning. <coughs> Greetings from your university in Laredo. Uh, you can see this is, no, that's not quite an O. I think there's one in between. No, there's, but then go one more because it's, well, one more. There's, one has been cut out then. Yeah. Well, we have it in our. Yeah. Do you have yeah. the one with the there four, the four, four pillars? Pillars? The four, the four, the page divided into four parts? Yes. Good. good. Okay, good. Well, quickly, that, those four pictures really tell our story better than anything else I can say. In the upper left corner, a young woman who just received her bachelor's degree, she's been being hugged by a faculty member who is herself in Japan. Uh, almost 30, well, 32 percent of our faculty have PhDs from outside the United States, International University. Uh, on the next picture to the right, the planetarium. This is part of our outreach to Laredo schools. 80,000 students have sat in that planetarium since it opened in 2005 for shows, and every day the buses pull up. It's even more remarkable when you consider there are only 85 seats in that planetarium, so it's almost constant showing to students. Uh, then to the bottom left, it, the pipe organ. It's a magnificent facility. Uh, talk about a rarity in Laredo, Texas, to have a world-class pipe organ. Um, and th these are students that are part of the orientation program. All the students, part of the orientation is to come in and hear the organ and learn the alma mater, uh, listening to the organ play it, uh, which is a lot of fun. And then the bottom right, uh, I guess the most moving one of all, a grandmother who never had a chance to go to college and never imagined in, in Laredo, Texas, there would be one, and her granddaughter just graduated. Mission and vision, uh, this, there are a lot of words on that screen that can all be said much simpler. We were created to change Laredo and change South Texas and therefore change Texas. And I, th I think that is exactly what we're doing. And, and the pictures you've seen before show that. We offer one, one uh, doctoral degree that's wholly our own, which is international business, from, precisely suited to the needs and the, and the reality of Laredo. We have a number of cooperative doctorates with other institutions. Our goals, the, uh, I salute the coordinating board and thank you for the clarity that you have continually given us on this. It, it's closing the gaps. It's recruit, retain, graduate. Um, each one of those, however, has a tremendous cost with it that I think we've not done a very good job explaining to the legislature why tuition has gone up. 
to recruit, we have to go out in the schools and get them. We go to, there's seven high schools in Laredo. We're on every campus our recruiters are at least two days a week, all year long. There is no other way to, to, to carry the message to non-traditional students and their family that university is a possibility. In terms of, in terms of retention, and you see we, we for, for recruitment, we grow between 5 and 10% of fall, each fall. We write our budget each year assuming a 5% growth. Last, last fall, I think it was 12, then 10. It, it, it continues to, 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 to spiral upward, and of course that's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Um, the retention uh, went from the high 50s to 72 percent when we instituted a, a mandatory freshman year program, divided the freshman class into learning communities, created a freshman course, increased advisement, counseling. But again, it's, it, it, there is a way to make non-traditional students successful. It is expensive. It is, it is human intensive. And finally, the graduation rate, I think a five-year rate of 50 percent is excessively modest, but I think there's something we, and I, I would be very happy if the coordinating board would push on this one. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge for our flagship institutions to get 50 percent out in four years. It's not that students can't graduate, it's that nobody sees the urgency to do it. And be on time was a wonderful idea, but unfortunately it's sort of uh, not, not been funded at a level to have the impact it should have. Uh, students should be graduating in four years. We now require every kid who receives a merit scholarship to take 15 hours per semester. If you take 12 hours, which is the, the, the norm for, for uh, Pell Grants, you can't possibly finish in four years. Uh, 15 you can. And, and I, we, we certainly think that 50 percent in five years is, is very reasonable. In terms of a projected growth, um, you can see between 05 and, and 15, these are the coordinating board figures that shows our growth at 58 percent. I think it'll be more than that. Uh, the growth in Laredo stops when the scholarship money runs out. One of the unexpected uh, results of the tremendous increase in the retention rate is that the scholarship money, the, the, the private philanthropy money, dried up very quickly. Before, when we, were, when we were in the 50s, there was a turnover each fall of students who fell out, failed out, left, for whatever reason were gone, freeing up money, and we had more money to give other students. When they stay, the money remains with them until they graduate. And we had a crisis um, last fall of suddenly, for the first time, we had, if, if a student couldn't, didn't qualify for Pell Grants, we had no sources of, of funds to give them. Retention's a good thing, but it means that they keep the money until they graduate. In terms of projects, um, as you can imagine, the, 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 the growth means that we are very, very squeezed. We're holding classes now in the student center in rooms that were never intended for classes. We hold them in conference rooms. We hold them in big, wide hallways. Um, we very much need more space. There are two projects under construction right now which are magnificent additions to the campus. One is fi finishing the fine arts theater. The, the room where you saw the pipe organ is a recital hall. Uh, at an L-shape L to it is a theater. When we built the, built the building, we didn't have the money to finish out the theater, so we shelled it in. Now, in the last session, we got an additional $5 million. The theater is being finished. It will be done in July. This fall, for the first time, we'll be able to use the building as intended. It's a magnificent space. Then the Student Success Building in Loop Road, this is a project of approximately $34 million, which builds a building on the south end of the campus to house all of the components of student recruitment and retention, all the outreach components, what it takes to get them in the university, financial aid, counseling, uh, uh, advising, all that goes into making them successful through the freshman and sophomore years. We know if we can get them to their junior year, they'll probably graduate. It's the freshman and sophomore year when things are slippery, and that building will house those functions. Um, a classroom building, that we need a, we need a generic classroom building. Uh, and, and in the Western Hemispheric Trade Center, when it was built, had a 500-seat auditorium, which we had to remove because the money just wouldn't reach. Uh, at this point, we only have six classrooms that will hold 100 or more students. We need more large classroom spaces, and that's, that's what that classroom building uh, would give us. In terms of the student center, we now have a, a, a tremendous squeeze for, for places to eat on campus. The, the food court, the, 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 the dining facilities are woefully inadequate. We're extremely proud to have an early college high school on campus. It's the only exemplary high school in Laredo, and the students are doing magnificently uh, with their work and, and with their with their very proud to be there. Laredo Independent School District is very proud. People have come all over Texas to see this. Uh, but it, it's a tremendous squeeze. How do we get our own students? How do we get those students? How do we get people fed? And, 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 and how do we expand the student center so they can actually 
be used as a student center. Right now, it's, it's largely classrooms because we need more classroom space. And then finally, the, 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 this is sort of an, an outlier, but an extremely interesting, exciting one. Our, our Congressman Henry Cuellar uh, and the Adjutant General of Texas uh, have been in Laredo many times now planning and talking about putting on the campus a federally funded um, Borderlands uh, Institute of Homeland Security. And it would be a federal facility that would pull together all of the various uh, law enforcement agencies in Laredo and on the border to, to train, to talk to each other, which doesn't happen now. Uh, they would like to connect it to our criminal justice program, our social sciences program. The Adjutant General got up and made a, a really uh, uh, amazing talk about how Homeland Security wasn't just who had the most guns and the most tanks, it was how do nations and, and cultures live together. And he very much wanted this placed on a university campus. There is now funding the Congressman has, has located in Washington and he's working now to move it from 2015 back to 2010 so that we can build it. It would be built to complement the style of our campus. It would be available for faculty, house, faculty classrooms, uh, offices and classrooms, students, and it would combine. It would, it would be a, a, an opportunity for the, all the research that goes in the university to feed into all of the needs and expectations of Homeland Security. That's the, that's the third initiative. It wouldn't be state money, but it would certainly ultimately be a federal and state project working together. Any questions for Dr. K? Chairman, how, how many of your uh, graduates are first generation? Well, it's, it's gone down, and this is an interesting, I, I want to believe that because we have been there, we're, and, and we are, we're now teaching the children of the people we taught. It was in the 70s, not too many years ago, and then it went to the 60s, now it's in the low 50s. This is a good trend, uh, and I hope the reason, we haven't drilled down to answer the question why, but it, it, it's moving down. We are over 90% 90, 90 Hispanic, I think it's 93 or 95% Hispanic. Um, and, and the numbers of people who now say, my mother went here, or my father went here, astounding. We're, this next year we celebrate our 40th anniversary. So if our mission is to change the face of South Texas, certainly a dropping number of first generation graduates would indicate that. We still have not um, uh, launched a broad um, uh, recruitment effort outside Laredo, in part because we haven't exhausted the need in Laredo. There's still a tremendous number of students in Laredo who don't come to school. And it's, it's not because there's anything in Hispanic culture about not wanting school, it's because people are poor and people are pressed and, and school seems beyond reach. And we go and to each individual student and bring them in is the, is the way they come and we still have not exhausted that need. So at the point that we expand beyond Laredo, um, I think that we'll, we may see that number go up if we, we attract first time students from outside. But we're beginning to make an impact if those numbers are, are, are an indication, I think they are. A falling number. Dr. Phillips? What, what have you done to um, relieve this crunch that your retention is causing for your incoming students who need scholarships? We've appealed to the community, and uh, it was wonderful. A, a local foundation immediately wrote out a check for $250,000. So here, just, that goes a long way. Yeah. Um, it, we have, we have, have redoubled our efforts at, at, at fundraising, um, and I'm happy to tell you that, that the greater community has been tremendously generous with, with Texas A&M International University. Our, the, the philanthropic effort that has, has focused on the university far exceeds anything that's ever happened in our region. Um, we've, we've told the story. We've asked people to, to we, we started a campaign of just $1,000 a piece. We need, we need lots of Laredo ones to give $1,000. The very first person, two people that wrote out the check were our Chancellor Mike McKinney and our Senator Judas Sapirini. So <laughs> making the point that this is, this is terribly important. It, it's good to retain, but then you don't have the turnover and scholarship availability. Well, this is a story that, that we need your help telling the legislature because uh, retention is crucial and it, as you said so well, retention is expensive. It is expensive. <laughs> Dr. Keck, I was on your campus, I guess, just a little over a year ago, and, and as uh, Dr. Phillips said about Corpus Christi, I can uh, add uh, that Laredo is a beautiful campus, having been mostly built out during the 90s. It's a relatively new campus, and the highlight of the tour was definitely the, the planetarium, and 
in the uh, heat of the Laredo summer, there's probably no better spot. <laughs> Dark, cool planetarium. <laughs> and, and I can't overstate how, how grateful we are and how aware we are of what the state of Texas did when it put a first-class facility there. There's not one ugly room, not one ugly piece of furniture, not one ugly corner in that university. It's all gorgeous. And the, we, have, we have not had trouble or issues with graffiti or defacing anything. Students are so in awe. Everyone is. It's just beautiful. And it, it's as beautiful as anything anywhere. And to try to do something as complex as change the face of a region, to begin by putting in place something that is a world-class, beautiful facility, was a very wise thing and a very generous thing. And the state did it. And we're very aware of it and very grateful. Any further questions? Um, is there any concern over conflict between cultural issues with the, the new? I'm, I'm very excited for the Border Security Institute, and I think that's a wonderful opportunity, especially for research and getting undergraduates involved in research opportunities. Um, but do you, do you see any clash of conflict or cultural issues with that being an enforcement kind of perspective versus first and second generation students being there? Well, it, yeah, it could be. But that's part of the mission, isn't it, to try to, to flatten those issues. The thing that, that I think all Laredoans are most proud of uh, is that ours may be the only city in Texas where there has never been cultural clash between the Hispanic and the gringo populations. It just doesn't exist. Uh, there haven't even been ethnic issues between the Catholics, the Protestants, the Jews. We have a, a large uh, Chinese community, we have a large Korean community, we have a large Arab community. People get along in many languages and people re relate to each other very easily. So it makes Laredo a wonderful showcase, showcase for how can you flatten out and blunt the culture clashes. We just haven't had them. Um, so to, to take that last one off the table, the fear that I'm going to be found and, and the the hesitation, yes, that, that would certainly be a mission. Uh, I, to a certain extent, I think we can never completely eliminate that problem, though, because the border is always going to be, my wife is a, a school nurse, and she's always talking about the great tidal pool. Every morning, this huge wave comes from Nuevo Laredo, and every evening it goes back out. It's said that if you count the population of Laredo, Texas, midday, uh, you have a figure that's staggering. If you count it at midnight and really could know who's in every bed, uh, it's a much lower number. But that's the border. I don't think we can change that. So some of what you say is going to be there forever. Um, but certainly the mission would be to try to figure out how it is in Laredo, Texas, we have avoided cultural, ethnic clashes, and how it is that that might be spread, that, that spirit might be spread. I agree. I think, um, I think it, the purpose of it being on a university campus would be very well served to, to be at that kind of a cultural communication bridge, since that is your history with it. Um, but I just thought that would be good. Well, the, the Ashton General said, I, I, want it, I want this on a university because I want people to think about how to get this right, which is very, very, very uh, Im uh, imaginative and, 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 and far-reaching think, far thinking on his part. And it, it launched this effort at the federal level. Thank you. Ray, one last question. Yes, sir. Do you know approximately what your, your key projects total? In terms total? Um, complete capital budget. Um, well, the, the, I can tell you quickly, the library project is $12 million. The library, I, didn't, I didn't refer to that, the library renovation. We, when we moved into the campus, uh, we were a third the size we are now, and half of the library was administration, half library. It's still that way. And three times as many students cram the library terribly. That's a $12 million project. Classroom building is 25, isn't that right, Juan? That's 32.5. 32 32 the Western Hemisphere uh, addition. Three million, and the student center renovation. It, we had a five million dollar plan to expand it, and that, we're still there. The borderland security. They were looking at a, a ten to twelve million dollar initial, but that, that's federal money. The the total for the uh, for the uh, what's under construction now is thirty four. Isn't that right, Virgil? Right. Yes. yes. So it'd be twelve plus thirty two plus um, three plus five. I'm sorry, we didn't didn't add those up for you. It's a, it looks like it's between 96 and 98 million. That presupposes a, 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 an enrollment con increase to continue, but there's no evidence it won't. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next uh, in the lineup is uh, Joe Garcia, Vice President of Finance and Administration at another beautiful campus, although it's been around a little longer, Texas A&M Kingsville. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members. 
Yes, uh, Kingsville's been around since about 1926, and we have some of the buildings that go back that far. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you'll see on our projects is uh, continuous remodeling and renovation. Uh, we currently are completing a $27 million redevelopment uh, project that has been uh, started by our system in conjunction with our system. And it's really, if you haven't been on the campus recently, you need to go. It's changed. The face of it has changed completely. Uh, call your attention to our mission. And of course, it, it's very similar as others. We're a Hispanic serving institution, and we want to focus uh, on bringing the education to the citizens of our region. The mission, of course, is to become nationally recognized. We offer about six PhD programs along with a full undergraduate and graduate program. Our goals uh, are to broaden that base of uh, productive and educated citizens, to enhance student learning, and we're getting more and more students. We currently are about out of space in our, in our dorms, and our dorms are very old. We're building, and you'll see in a minute, we're building uh, some new dorms that will open up uh, this fall. Uh, we want to promote the development of scholarly research and creative activities uh, that are nationally recognized, such as the uh, Clayburg Wildlife Center and the Ranch Management Institute. And we want to provide a learner-centered -center in environment. If we look at our enrollment, you can see what our current enrollment is in the primary 10-county area where our students come from. And you look at our projections. Uh, for many years, Kingsville had been on a downward uh, trend in enrollment. It uh, stabilized this past year, and we expect to see um, a trend and go, going back up. We have a new president, President Talent, and he sends his regards. He's at a groundbreaking at our Citrus Center in Westlaco and could not be here. But uh, he has, uh, he is providing the leadership for the university that will uh, change that university, I think, considerably. We also have been, uh, have had a center in San Antonio, which recently uh, separated, and they are Texas A&M uh, San Antonio now. So you can see some of that enrollment uh, has been taken off this and is not reflected here. You'll hear about that a little bit uh, later, right after me. Uh, looking at our key projects, I mentioned the Citrus Center building uh, in Westlaco, uh, 37 or $9.5 million building. The groundbreaking is this afternoon. We have some resident uh, hall apartments. <coughs> we have phase one that will open up here in August, about 300 or so beds. And then we have a phase two, the remainder of it, that will open up in, in October. And you can see that we've had some library work uh, currently and a biology earth science building renovation. We have a large auditorium there that had already been renovated. And now we have a big challenge in renovating the science building because we have something like 400 and some odd labs all over campus and, and at our research centers. And we're going to have to do this in phases, do part of it, then open that up, and then move over. <clears throat> if you look at most of the other projects, you can see through the years, they are a lot of renovation. Uh, we just knocked down one building. We're in the process of knocking down a second building. And uh, as soon as we finish a study on the student union, the student union is, is very old and, and well used, I might say. And uh, we have an engineer study, architect engineer study, ongoing right now to look at that center and determine whether we need to remodel it, whether that would be uh, more feasible or we <coughs> need to knock it down and start over. So that we will have that back. The music uh, building renovation. We have one of the best music programs, I think, in Texas, and we produce a lot of teachers in that area. And that program is recognized uh, 
uh, widely, and we need to, to remodel their building. We remodeled it once enough to, to retain the accreditation, but it still needs, needs a lot of work. Um, if you look at one of the things that we had further down, we had a University Village dining facility, and we're reconsidering that and looking to move that up because we're out of space. If you go in our dining room right now at the Student Union, uh, students uh, come in there, they're asked to eat quickly and, and move out. It is completely full. And the indications this year for our dorms is that they will be completely filled. We currently have a little over 1,400 students in those dorms, and uh, the new facility is oversubscribed right now. So that's, that's a very good indication. But we need to move forward and look at, at a way to, and we have uh, figured out a way to go ahead and look at that facility and try to build that facility sooner. We've got a stopgap measure for for the fall, but we need to move quickly on that facility. And that's basically uh, the main projects that we have. Thank you, Joe. Do you, can you tell me approximately what your total capital budget is for these key projects? And approximately about $80 million. It's, yeah, it's roughly about $80 million or so. But I certainly took note that uh, but between now through 2011, you've got 15 projects and oh, yes. nine of them are renovations. Sure, so. sure. And, and that will depend, you know, uh, on the funding source and so forth as, as to uh, how much of it we do. Uh, the other thing that's needed on campus that's included in there is, is uh, remodeling of a, of a central plant. We have a main plant and we have a, a subsidiary plant, and that plant is very old and needs need some replacement. But in general, one of the things at our campus is the need for remodeling and renewing things. Like I said, the current, we've had something like 70, 80 million dollars of projects ongoing recently. And a lot of that is uh, redoing signage, uh, it, uh, the, the grounds, just everything. Washing the buildings, one of the things being close to the coast there that we get, we get a lot of mildew on the buildings. And it's amazing to see them clean because, you know, they look brand new even though they may have been built in the 50s and so forth. Hey, Mr. Chairman, just a quick question. And this is the first time for me to be able to go through and listen to one of these master plan presentations and appreciate the opportunity. But have we been focusing at all on these in terms of discussing the deferred maintenance levels for these campuses and the master plans too, or are y'all doing that outside the scope of this? That is that is uh, actually outside the scope, but I was at the end I had a question for Virgil on that. that I think for most systems and most campuses, that's the elephant in the room. Right. And, and Texas A&M University system is, is in, about to complete at the end of this month a survey on that exact question that I'll ask Virgil to address later. Okay. I thought you were going to ask him a question, so I got it. Okay. <laughs> we'll come back to that, Virgil. But I think that's a really, uh, yeah. maybe it's a wrap-up and really just talking about the level of deferred maintenance that you see the whole A&M system because it is the elephant in the room and yes, uh, I, I'm it aware is. of the study you did and when I hear a significant number of your projects you know as old as your campus is as long as you've been there that's what's got to be driving a big part of those sure. dollars right now so um, you know maybe we'll wrap back into that Virgil at the back end you can make a comment as it relates to the whole system and then actually the survey that they're doing right now, which was a pretty significant one, is just for College Station. Yes, oh, okay. just for College is Station. Yeah. Okay. But it will give you a, quite a startling idea of what, what the entire state might look like. So. Okay. Um, next is uh, Dr. Carolyn Green with uh, the newly uh, designated Texas A&M University San Antonio. And congratulations, congratulations. on becoming a standalone campus. Well, good morning, and I bring greetings from San Antonio, and not only from the, the city, but from our students and alumni who are very excited about this new uh, turn of events for us. The system, the Texas A&M San Antonio began as a system center, as you know, under the direction of A&M Kingsville in the fall of 2000. 
and until uh, the past couple of years, the enrollment had grown and then really sort of leveled out, and we were not seeing growth. Two years ago, with the addition of some funding and the ability to add more programs and more space, we were able to see uh, considerable growth and have, have grown by more than 50 percent in the recent year. Um, on the, let's see, if you can go back to the picture for just a minute. Oh, it's not there. <coughs> We have it. We have you it. have the diamond. I just wanted to draw your attention to the to the the uh, picture that you have there for San, the San Antonio campus. This is uh, from the project that we have completed recently. It is the campus development plan, and it lays out a, a plan for long-term development for a campus to be able to support as many as 25,000 students uh, in the future. Um, we have uh, completed this and have now uh, we have a request for quotations out for architects to. Uh, begin the work uh, of developing our very first building. The Texas A&M San Antonio is an upper division institution. We offer uh, classes to juniors and seniors. Most of our students come to us as transfers from the community college district in the San Antonio area. More than 50,000 students uh, in the area and um, we have a wonderful partner partnership with them. We also offer master's level programs in a variety of areas. Our mission focuses on uh, academic and co-curricular programs to help our students be successful. We uh, are also uh, focusing on economic and social development of the community and region around us. Our mission includes teaching, scholarship, research, and public service to our area. Some of our short-term goals include continuing to contribute to closing the gaps by providing access, excellence in teaching, and affordability to a very underserved area on the south side of San Antonio. Currently, our student population uh, is 66 percent Hispanic. The average age of our students is 32, and um, 70 percent of our students are female. This non-traditional population has been growing, and we've been seeing wonderful success in uh, their completing their degrees. Another area that, that we are focusing on is our, in partnership with uh, five school districts around us. We're part of a P-16 council in our little south side area. And in partnership with those school districts, we are working together with our education programs to uh, focus on uh, reevaluating and revamping our curriculum in teacher preparation in order to try to better prepare teachers for the classrooms and the school districts around us. And our goal is to see much better results in student success in the, the public schools and to have our teachers be well prepared for those environments. Um, a, a third area that we're focusing on is meeting some of the needs of the business community in the San Antonio area. And one of the things that we found in talking with the community around us is that there is a shortage in information technology. And the firms and a growing IT group within the San Antonio and larger area uh, are looking for more graduates from information systems programs. And so we're working on developing an IT and management center that will um, work to provide students who are better prepared in those areas and we're looking for ways uh, efficiently to be able to provide more variety and more cutting-edge uh, offerings in our courses to better prepare those students. And the fourth area is uh, in applied research and so in addition to what we're doing in trying to pr improve teacher education and um, better prepare our students for the workforce around us, we are doing some early planning to uh, work with an irrigation technology center that is uh, housed in uh, College Station in the AgriLife Division. Um, part of the plan all along for our campus has been to have some land available for an irrigation technology center. And so we are working along with that irrig irrigation technology center to uh, develop academic programs that complement their work and to work on research opportunities in bringing better irrigation technology to the South San Antonio area. And our vision long term is to be an integrated world class university with a community of learning and practice on a state of the art campus on the south side of San Antonio with a campus that reflects the history and culture of our area. If we look at enrollment, um, currently uh, we've got a map here too that shows where our students come from. In the center of that with the green uh, area is Bear County. 
and of the 1,600 plus students that we have, more than 1,300 come from the Bear County area. And then the, the largest concentrations outside of that are in the counties to the south and over toward the east in sort of a semicircle around the San Antonio area. In this past year, we had an enrollment of almost 1,700 students. Um, in the, the coming year, we project growth to 2,400, and um, we estimate about 15% growth over the next few years. That is consistent with the growth that we've seen over the past two years as we've added more capacity. Uh, coming to, to projects, currently we are uh, operating in an elementary school that we have leased from South San Antonio Independent School District. The district has been absolutely wonderful in assisting us. They came to us and offered us an unused elementary school facility, about 53,000 uh, gross square feet. Um, they offered it uh, for a dollar a year. And the thing that the school board was most interested in was having scholarships for graduates from their high schools. So part of the arrangement is also that we provide 10 full scholarships with tuition fees and books to graduates of their uh, high school programs. Not only those that are uh, attending our, our school at our campus, but those who are at Palo Alto and planning to come to Texas A&M San Antonio. <coughs> And it's been a very successful program and those students coming on to us and also now coming to graduation. So we're very thankful for that partnership. It has made it possible for us to grow to this point, but our growth has also meant that we are now seeking additional space. And so they've let us use some space in a nearby <coughs> uh, middle school that we can use in the evenings after 4 o'clock. Palo Alto College. Uh, uh, who hosted us for many years as a system center, has also extended to us uh, access to new classroom space. And so uh, as we run out of space where we are right now, we are beginning to pick up some space on the Palo Alto campus. Overall, um, we definitely have a shortage of space, and as we grow, that will continue. So with the, the new development, uh, we're working now on the, on the design of the very first building, selecting the architectural firms that will do that and the uh, construction management firm that will guide the project. We're also looking ahead. We know uh, the, the first building is to be a multi-use building, and uh, it's estimated to be about 80,000 square feet when it's done. And we know that our campus, even with the number of students and uh, faculty and staff that we have, will not fit there. We recognize that we'll continue to operate in some of the space we're in now as the new building comes online. And so we've been looking ahead. Uh, in this past session, we had uh, among the TRB requests a request for $60 million for a second general purpose building, also to include uh, science labs in that building. Right now, we use science labs on Palo Alto's campus. They've been very gracious to share space with us. But we know that long term, they're growing, and we're growing, and we need some more uh, science labs. This uh, second project would also include the establishment or building of a central plant to begin to support the larger campus and some additional parking. Longer term, we know that we have needs for a library. Currently, we make use of library services from several sources, and we're looking now to set aside space for a librarian and some uh, small offerings uh, on our site, but we know we have a need for more than that. And then, in addition, ultimately, a student center and support for our growing undergraduate and graduate level kinesiology program. Uh, we have need to, to support those pro that program and its needs, as well as providing for some space like that for our students. Thank you, Dr. Green. Are there any questions? Do you know what your uh, program totals out through the next five years? Um, Leaving out the $40 million that we already have the, the TRB for, it would be $255 million. $255? And the $40 million TRBs, is, that's being applied to the building that's currently under design? Yes. That's correct. Okay. Anyone else have any questions about San Antonio? Or any glowing Chamber of Commerce <laughs> remarks? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll take it. Um, you know, it, it's hard to imagine when she says we're in an elementary school. They've done unbelievable things with that elementary school. And it really does feel like a college campus. And it's it's not your run-of-the-mill elementary schools, so it's a very nice facility to begin with. But then they've it done was. 
some tremendous work. I think one of the things that we need to highlight is the focus on education, educator training and new methodologies for training educators, which we know at, at the board we've talked a lot about in terms of something that we really need to focus on. So that was um, a very good program to be um, centered around. So, so that was exciting as well. The community is very, very excited about this new campus. Um, there is a lot of support from all sectors. Uh, San Antonio will be proud to host um, UT system, A&M system, and a part of Texas Tech system uh, in our community. And it'll just be a learning laboratory for recruitment of Hispanics um, first generation and otherwise uh, into the higher education system and, and that's exciting too. A lot of things that our, our board needs to be focused on in that regard. Mm -hmm. So thank you for being here. Thank you. What was the school district that, that uh, donated the um, elementary school for a dollar a year? South San Antonio South ISD. San Antonio. One of the concerns was obviously the pipeline and how, how in this part of the community would there be a pipeline for higher education because if you look at the demographics and the numbers today, they do not support a higher education facility. But again, as, as you heard in her remarks, um, there, there was already a, a very specific P16 council set up uh, how many years ago? It's been in existence for about eight years. Eight years that has been looking at the feeder schools in that community and really reaching out to recruit and get kids excited about going into higher education. And the mere location of, of the entity, even right now as an elementary school, for those surrounding communities, most of the kids had not seen a college campus. True. So they're, they're really breaking new grounds and it's very exciting. Yeah, we're really excited too. We're partnering with Palo Alto College on a coordinating board grant, a two plus two plus two and are working with them to be in the high schools now. And um, in our partnership with the, the Alamo Colleges, there are five uh, community colleges there in town, uh, we have made it possible for students who have completed 30 hours to go ahead and be admitted with us if they meet all other criteria and be uh, dual enrolled. And we are working to really partner with the districts to make it a seamless transition for the students, to assist them in making a plan from the very start for what they're going to do in completing a bachelor's degree. And uh, you know how the problem that students often have in transfer, if they haven't planned, they, haven't, they may take classes that are not really going to benefit them. And we're working to, to try to uh, avoid that, to give them good information, good planning, and to make it very seamless to go ahead and continue. Any further questions? I would also like to commend your university. You said the average age of your student is 32 yes. at this point. Um, as closing the gaps goals becomes more and more difficult with participation, that I think is an increasing area that we need to focus on. Um, bringing back to school students that are older, especially as the recession continues to affect the economy, um, that's one area we could really excel. So I, I commend you for that as well. All right, well, Dr. Green, we uh, appreciate it. And again, congratulations on, uh, on being an independent university now. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, uh, Mr. Bob Brown, Vice President for Business and Administration with Texas A&M University Commerce. Good morning. I bring you greetings on behalf of our President, Dr. Dan Jones. Dr. Jones is out of the country and can't be here this morning, but wanted me to thank you for the opportunity to come, come here and talk about uh, the excitement at Texas A&M University of Commerce. We're a 120-year-old institution. Uh, it's good to be here with a bunch of uh, young universities and hear <laughs> their, their needs. Uh, ours, ours are a little different. But I would like to uh, draw your attention to this picture because a major physical transformation has happened on this campus uh, during the last five years. Under leadership of Dr. McFarland and now uh, continued with Dr. Jones, uh, we have seen a transformation and like other campuses you heard this morning, we would invite you to come to East Texas and, and look at our campus. We have had, our students have um, constructed two new buildings, a recreation center and a new uh, student center. The state has um, constructed a science building. You, re you recently authorized the purchase of a private residence hall to increase the uh, quality of our residential living and we currently have a music building underway. It's a phenomenally different place than it was a number of years ago and, and hope you'll visit soon. The mission of A&M Commerce uh, remains to be an important player in our region to deliver a personal education experience. How that's translated at our university over time is that we have small classrooms. If we wanted to 
try and teach someone a class with 250 students, we would not be able to do that. There's been a, a philosophy at our institution to keep classrooms small, uh, to provide um, cutting edge counseling advisement, and to try to be a very personal touch uh, with our students. We continue to work to expand our research mission in agriculture, science, and education, as well as other fields, and we um, are always cognizant to remember our rural roots, our responsibility to rural East Texas, still as uh, technology uh, expands in our region and other types of employers uh, enter the region. University priorities, the first one I'd like to spend just a moment or two of time. The uh, Honors College is a residential learning experience that next fall will enroll 150 of the best and brightest students from our region and the state. Um, this Honors College provides tuition, fees, room, and board uh, for four years to extraordinary students. Uh, it is changing the nature of the undergraduate experience on campus by having these extraordinary students in the classroom interacting with our faculty. There's nothing better to increase student performance than to see another student right beside them uh, performing well and doing well in, in class. And it is a, uh, ultimately to be 200 students, we're adding 50 students a year, and uh, it is making, making a, a difference on campus. Our goal is to increase enrollment by uh, 5% uh, for each of the next, uh, next five years. We currently enroll 8,800 students. We are uh, largely a transfer institution now. Uh, it's not uncommon to see years when uh, our freshman class and our senior class are larger than our, I mean, our, I'm sorry, our junior class and our senior class are larger than our freshman class. We intend to become military friendly. Uh, we know the new GI Bill is an important uh, tool uh, to help those, those folks who have been defending our freedom uh, to come home and to continue their education and we're going to focus strongly on that group of students as well as working toward uh, becoming a Hispanic serving institution. With more than 14 community colleges within 75 miles of the campus, it is evident from their student body, which is continually largely uh, continues to grow in Hispanic uh, population, that we need to be ready for that and we need to reach out and embrace that as part of our responsibility. You'll see our other initiatives there as well. We have some infrastructure challenges being an older institution. Our residence halls are obsolete in design. Last year we commissioned a master plan for our uh, residential living and have begun uh, to address the needs identified in that master plan. Our current library is a wonderful building, but it's been designed over, and, um, over three separate um, cycles and is, is looks like it's a building that has been uh, built in three different time periods. It's a great place <laughs> to house books, uh, but that's not what a library is about now. Certainly, there needs to be uh, uh, there need to be academic materials in there, but the modern library is also a space uh, where collaboration occurs, where advanced research using technology occurs, and our library is just not designed for that purpose. We have outdated classroom and laboratory facilities. Um, a big effort in the last several years has also been the modernization of our utilities and our new, and improving our energy management. We put in new boilers, chillers, all the sorts of deferred maintenance that, uh, that uh, we heard referenced earlier to try and improve our, our energy management. We also do our own water system and we've had uh, to work on keeping our water system up to standards and our water secure as well. Uh, and then we have about 40% of our enrollment that occurs either off-site or online, and we have needs for uh, evaluating our classroom space and our classroom needs uh, off the uh, Commerce campus. Our major capital plans are relatively modest compared to the, the universities you've heard early, earlier today. We are currently constructing a music building uh, that will be completed by June of next year. The $27 million project uh, and really going to be a phenomenal asset to our region and to our College of Education as well as our music pro program. We use our uh, music program to um, help teach a lot of the music teachers that you'll see in our elementary and middle school and high school teachers, a lot of the band directors, uh, they're, they're A&M Commerce graduates. Local funding will be 
identified to begin phase one of our renovation of our housing program. Uh, we hope to begin design next fall on a uh, the first residential space, which will be 400 beds to replace uh, some out, uh, outdated residence halls that are on the southwest corner of our campus. And then renovation of G Library, which you heard me refer to earlier. You do not see a direct project on here to address the outdated classroom and lab space. That's because Dr. Jones has just authorized a revision to our master plan, so we'll be spending the next uh, 15 to 18 months uh, matching our facilities and our educational master plan together and would expect to come back to you with that uh, in about 18 months. Questions for Mr. Brown. What uh, your latter two projects, uh, Bob, the new student apartments uh, first phase in the uh, renovation of G Library, what, what are the budgets for those? $20 million for the uh, <clears throat> renovation of the housing for the new housing space rather and 32 million dollars for G library thank you and uh, what is the current enrollment in commerce 8800 students 8800 roughly split between graduates and undergraduates okay Joe did you have any Questions or comments on regarding your alma mater? No, I just support uh, everything Bob said. <laughs> <laughs> I was there when those buildings were falling down. <laughs> it's amazing, we're going to get some good things. You mean they were falling down when you were there? Yeah, they were. <laughs> well, I, I thought you were going to say that when you were there when they were starting construction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's tacky. <laughs> Sorry, it was just an easy setup. No, I'll tell you, that. Uh, that uh, Campus does not look like the same place it was just a few years ago. The changes are rather dramatic and dynamic in every way you look at it. And there's a lot of potential there because the growth coming from Dallas uh, east is, uh, you know, we're in a great location. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, we appreciate the presentation. And, uh, Virgil, we appreciate the leadership lineup that you brought us. Is, is there any uh, concluding remarks or you'd like to make? I uh, just wanted to uh, thank you for allowing us to come and, and share the insight. And you, you marked about the uh, deferred maintenance. Uh, as all of you know, uh, there is a benchmark criteria uh, uh, that's addressed on the approval of every project. And uh, we, we have something that we call a physical plant directors meeting periodically in the system. And I know for a fact that all of our uh, plant directors are working very hard with various amounts of money and programs to maintain uh, the numbers uh, where they are right now. If I remember correctly, Galveston is the only one that actually has a plan on file now uh, specifically to get back below the number, uh, Texas a and University Galveston. Uh, the others, I think, are within the benchmark. You mentioned Texas a and m University and College Station. Uh, they recently completed a, a facility condition assessment uh, that was done by the physical plant uh, operation there. Uh, the number, uh, actually I just talked to him on the phone yesterday uh, about it, and it's slightly over a billion dollars uh, is what they are going to come up with. Before we get too excited about that, we remind you that that billion dollars will be categorized in terms of various priority uh, in terms of uh, criteria and, and work that needs to be done immediately uh, versus those things that can be done postponed even further. Mm -hmm. uh, they have yet to come up with a plan as to what they will do, but in defense of that, I will say that they are currently uh, within their uh, benchmark number uh, with their work that, that they're doing there. But I know it's a big issue on their radar, and they'll be working about working with it, uh, as we all will. I understand that the, the consultant that was hired is going to do a presentation of their their findings uh, on or about June 30th uh, to your physical plant folks. And um, I just was there a couple of weeks ago with Susan, and the, we were briefed on the report and the number that you just referenced. Um, but it not only includes deferred maintenance, but it also includes um, uh, issues like uh, Technology in right. terms of right. energy efficiency, technology and education. Yeah. And what was the other category? You were calling? <clears throat> they used capital renewal just for capital plans. renewal. Yes, capital for renewal. Plans. renewal. Capital yeah. renewal. Objections of the of the current facilities off into the future, but it is a significant number. And I, this committee, if not the entire board, I think would 
at some point in the not too distant future uh, learn a lot from a presentation on, on that report um, as well because I think A&M College Station is uh, that will kind of provide an example to us that, that we can uh, prorate for the entire state and get some idea perhaps even communicate to the legislature uh, what the needs of our institutions are beyond just new capital projects. That's correct, sir. So, anyway, again, thanks for being here today, and thanks for lining up the presentation, Virgil. Okay. Thank you very much. I think I'm next on the agenda. So oh, yeah, you don't have to move. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move to agenda item 2E. Uh, there's two projects on our agenda today for committee recommendation to the board, and the first is a request from Texas A&M University's College of Veterinary Medicine to reapprove the Veterinary Research Building Edition. I'll let you segue right into that. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the project was originally approved by the Coordinating Board in September of 06 at a total budget of about $18 million. Uh, the approved project is a three-story uh, research laboratory edition with a mechanical uh, penthouse located off of Raymond Stotzer Parkway. Uh, it contains about 26 research labs and associated faculty offices and a significant number of which were left uh, as shell space uh, as we started to build the project. Next slide. Uh, the research building is now under construction uh, in the area of the College of Veterinary Medicine uh, on the east side of the existing uh, veterinary medicine uh, research building. Uh, go ahead and show the next slide. Uh, see, this is a representative layout of the uh, finish of the, of the floor space, uh, uh, shell space that we have. So it's a fairly uniform uh, building uh, that we have there. Uh, this is a more detailed uh, of a typical lab uh, that we will have in this project. Go ahead. Jeez, uh, our slides got cut off. Seems like some are missing. But, but anyway, uh, in addition to containing required mechanical equipment, the space in the mechanical penthouse uh, for the addition became significantly larger. Uh, than anticipated in original design, so that's been one addition to the project as well. And the addition of the finish uh, of the shell space and office spaces and the additional building square footage uh, located in the penthouse have resulted in a new project budget that exceeds a 10% uh, limit. Uh, we're therefore requesting reapproval of the project as described uh, with the in the construction application at a new budget of about $25,477,265. Or the in questions, and we were missing some slides. I hope you you have those. Well, I think we've got at least one additional slide that, that wasn't yeah. there. So the, uh, and the there are handouts on each of these projects at your place that we'll be going through. The reason this project is coming uh, up today for recommendation, a decision toward the board is uh, is not because it doesn't meet our approval level. It does <clears throat> because the board of regents uh, at Texas A&M University system. Uh, uh, was not able to address uh, this and approve this at their May meeting, and I think it's on their agenda uh, for the July board yes. meeting a week or so before our own board meeting. So uh, we're being asked to decide uh, whether to recommend this to the board because of the timing discrepancy. <clears throat> You're not going to be recommending it. You're going to be um, saying pending approval of their board. That's what I meant. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you say that. <laughs> that goes without saying. Um, any questions for Virgil about this project? Okay. All right. As Susan uh, correctly pointed out, then uh, we pass this to the board pending approval by Texas A&M's Board of Regents. Uh, so moved. We have a motion from Vice Chair Mendoza. Is there a second? Second. Second from Dr. Phillips. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Thanks, Virgil. All right. Thank you. The next project is uh, from the University of Houston uh, regarding the purchase of the University Business Park. And uh, Dale Irvin is here to present that. Good morning. I'm uh, Dave Irvin. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you this morning. This is an uh, opportunity that uh, is not on our MP1 list. Sometimes things happen uh, that you don't anticipate. The project we're talking about is the University <laughs> Business Park. It's a property that's located next to the main UH campus that we've uh, occupied a portion of for a number of years. Our finance folks are uh, there as well as some, some of our back, back office operations. Um, and we uh, 
had, were approached by the owners, uh, they're in, as many people are, some financial difficulties, and they were looking to sell. Uh, and so we've uh, been under negotiations with them. The map that you see shows why we're considering this a very opportune uh, potential property for us. It's right next to the campus. Um, Wheeler Street, which is the south border of the campus, the city is uh, looking to extend Wheeler Street, which would extend it to this property. The property is also next to a property that we previously purchased and this board approved, 4902 Golf. It's next to our um, university um, electrical plant. So it's a great location. Uh, next slide. This uh, map shows that there's 17 buildings on the property. It's about 69 acres. Of that, 19 of it is undeveloped, so it provides the opportunity for future buildings. We're already in some conversations with uh, various folks that are interested in wind blade research and some others that are looking at building buildings and would like to cooperate with the university. It would provide opportunities for that. The 17 buildings there are a mix of office buildings and uh, warehouse space. Uh, as I said, we occupy um, <clears throat> about uh, 35 to 40 percent of the space. Um, and the warehouse space is uh, ideally suited for engineering research, for structures testing, for wind blade testing, for a lot of things that we're looking to do in terms of uh, increasing our tier one research and uh, moving aggressively into energy and uh, energy research, including future uh, energy sources. Next slide. Um, as I said, there's 580,000 square feet. Uh, about 220,000 of that is office space. 360,000 roughly is a warehouse and mixed use space. And there is also a 1,400 parking spaces, which if you've been on our campus, there's many people that think that might be the most valuable part of this entire <laughs> uh, acquisition. What uh, is particularly uh, nice about this property, there are a number of leases there already, many of which are involved in energy. And uh, we would keep those tenants and add to them so that the tenant mix, along with what we're already paying in rent, would pay the debt service on this property as well as the deferred maintenance and the operating. So uh, it's a very attractive uh, proposition for us. Uh, we would be occupying as several buildings we aren't now, which we would uh, give to energy research and, and uh, wind blade testing, those kinds of things. Um, and then we would lease out the rest of it to some companies who are related in the energy field who are interested in uh, working with us. Next slide. Very quickly, uh, it serves several goals. Uh, we could increase our educational offerings, uh, particularly in petroleum energy and some, uh, and some other things uh, that uh, the board has recently approved. Uh, we would dramatically be able to increase our research and our scientific research. We have a number of federal grants that we have already applied for, a number of companies that have already approached us that want to do joint research, and we're just waiting for the space to be able to do that. And then it also allows us to vacate some offices on the central campus, moves additional administrative things to this site, and that allows us to free up academic space, which means that there's one academic building, which was on our MP1 list, we won't have to build now because of this property. Um, so all in all, it, it's a really great opportunity for the university and uh, a great location. Last slide. The purchase price is $27 million. Uh, that's the lowest of the two appraisals that we have. Um, but I might mention that there's the price is actually less than that because the seller has agreed to do a couple of things. First, they've agreed to do all environmental remediation on the site, which is significant. And secondly, they've agreed to do all of the critical deferred maintenance. So as part of this, we're getting uh, new HVAC systems in two buildings and four uh, brand new roofs. So um, actually when you deduct those, the purchase price is really close to about $22 million. So we think it's a great deal for the university. We heartily recommend your uh, approval and uh, I'll answer any questions you might have. Dave, is the, um, asbestos, the future asbestos uh, remediation, is that included in the seller's responsibilities? No, it isn't. Their, their responsibility is, is mainly dealing with uh, groundwater contamination, soil contamination. The asbestos is, uh, is not a problem until you start to do renovation. It's, it's non-flyable. Um, it's in the ceiling tile and the floor tile, those kinds of things. Um, but it's not a problem as if you just want to occupy the space. It might be in some of the offices, buildings, when we get to renovate, renovating them, but that's something we would be doing a ways down the road. Is there a projection on what that cost would be over time as you renovate or repurpose the space? It's, it's, uh, we do have that. It's, it's uh, a fairly minor amount. It's, it's, I remember I think it's about 200000 altogether. <laughs> 
Um, but it's the nice thing is it's uh, the kind of asbestos. It's relatively easy to do. Most general contractors can do that kind of work. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Staff recommends approval of this project uh, in terms of recommendation to the board. Um, is there a motion? So moved. Have a motion. Second. Does it? Second from Dr. Phillips. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. All right. Next, we'll move to agenda item two F. <clears throat> uh, there uh, are two of uh, the four projects on here for committee approval that were not on our consent calendar. Um, first project is a request from Midwestern State University for second reapproval in the renovation of D.L. Ligon Coliseum. Uh, Alan Goldap, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, sir. Uh, with Midwestern is here and... Juan Sandoval, Vice President for uh, Administration and Finance. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, by way of introduction, let me just uh, tell you the uh, uh, the financial specifics on, on this project and then and let uh, Alan sp explain uh, all the details of it. It first started by uh, a request for uh, tuition revenue bond uh, consideration uh, a couple of sessions ago, uh, actually uh, the 79th uh, legislative session uh, where we received uh, TRB approval uh, for a $7.7 .7 million project. We had requested uh, $12 million. We were too modest. Uh, if the truth <laughs> be known, it should have been more like $15, $16 million. Uh, Nevertheless, we were grateful for having received that, but we quickly strategized to see if we can leverage the project a little bit further. Uh, we settled uh, at known uh, revenues to support a project of $9,368,000. Uh, Mr. Goldup and, and other engineers were saying, Juan, we cannot reach it at 9.368. Uh, and, and we looked at all the um, creative uh, models that were available to us that we could support. And, and we came up with a project that is 7.7 uh, .7 in tuition revenue bond funding, 1.7 million in, in uh, master lease uh, project. We have private sources of 900,000 and 200,000 local sources. Uh, with that, I'll yield to Mr. Alan Goldat. Well, D.L. Ligon Coliseum was a 69 facility, and as many of the buildings on the Midwestern campus there uh, beginning to age. Uh, it was uh, a fairly minor renovation was done in 99, about 20% of the building for classroom space. Um, the infrastructure is well past its useful life, and that has been our target uh, through this project. Uh, one of the real challenges in this building, it has some rather interesting um, applications of asbestos in it, and that's made this uh, design and renovation uh, particularly challenging. Uh, the facility, of course, uh, because of age, um, needs a lot of improvement where TOS and ADA is concerned. And our goal uh, are the overall 80% the of the building has not been updated in 40 years. That includes restrooms, all uh, of the various facilities in the main part of the building. Um, the uh, we did a uh, preliminary design uh, engineering estimate, and we had uh, nearly $9 million worth of infrastructure needs, which included mechanical, electrical, life safety, and, and roofing. This did not even address the TOS and ADA at the time that the uh, initial uh, look was done. Um, current project stands at $9.3 million, and that will do only the infrastructure. Uh, the administration has made the decision that we will get the guts of this building um, in condition so that whatever future work we do, um, the deferred maintenance and other uh, systems, mechanical, electrical, uh, that go with the mechanical systems, and life safety, fire, de fire detection, suppression, roofing, uh, toss and ADA will be complete. Um, the additional money that's being requested in this one will 
um, allow a modest renovation of a portion of, of the uh, uh, locker room space. It's architectural, but again, it's a uh, because of the age of the building, the extent uh, is quite dramatic. It requires removing all the concrete floors. Basically, the space gets stripped back to the columns and, and concrete structures, and we start over from the inside of the building. Um, and as Juan's mentioned, we still have challenges in that building, and uh, they're uh, looking at how to do future funding to do the rest of the architectural work. Any questions? Questions uh, from committee members? The, uh, in your presentation, of course, you pretty clear that the that the increase is this uh, architectural reconstruction of the locker room space but in the board in the booklet materials we've got uh, the, the big increase was in life safety compliance uh, 160 percent jump uh, over about a million four um, is that just a recategorization it's a recategorization is the asbestos abatement part of that life cycle uh, life uh, the asbestos abatement has been um, the way this project was structured and the work done, the asbestos has been a portion of each section. Um, the mechanical required certain asbestos abatement. We've had to do uh, abatement with each phase of it. Um, and right now we stand at about a half million dollars worth of asbestos abatement on the project. The, uh the athletic fee, it says legislatively approved, but uh, is that something that the student body also voted on? Yes, yes. sir. Any, any other questions for these gentlemen? Uh, the project does meet uh, our uh, standards and uh, the staff recommendation is for approval of the evaluation. So if there are no further questions, the chair will entertain a motion. I approve. I have a motion from Dr. Phillips. Is there a second? Second. I have a second from Ms. Payovich. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. The second project um, from uh, Texas A&M to Construct University Apartments is on our consent calendar, as is the third project from UTMB Anderson regarding their mid-campus parking facility. Um, so we will move to the last and the fourth project, which is a request from the University of North Texas at Dallas to construct the UNT Dallas Campus Second Building. We have with us Richard Escalante and Dr. John Price uh, with University of Texas at Dallas uh, to provide an overview. And before we start, I want to congratulate you on becoming uh, a standalone uh, campus. Thank you, Mr. And Chairman. We're excited about your, your future. Good morning. Uh, I'm Richard Escalante, I'm Vice Chancellor for Administrative Services, and with us, as you indicated, is uh, Dr. Price, Vice Chancellor and President Designate of the University of North Texas at Dallas. We also have here uh, Lillian Gonzalez, our senior architect on this project, and Meredith Butler, who is a senior programmer with us. Uh, we are here today to discuss uh, the new building at the UNT Dallas campus. Uh, there is only one building on the campus at this time. Uh, that building does not include any science labs, any dedicated library of any significant size. The building lacks office space for the authorized faculty and staff. And uh, we currently rent trailers uh, to provide office uh, space. Uh, the current building with 46,000 net assignable square feet uh, is well used, but it just is not sufficient to meet the needs of our growing enrollment. Additional classroom space, labs, and offices are essential to accommodate continued growth and accreditation requirements. The Board of Regents realized a need for additional building, and in August 2008, the Board of Regents authorized the design of the second building using local funds. Uh, the architect began to design the building, and uh, the uh, with three three major. Uh, uh, criteria. One is to meet the, the campus priority needs, and those refer to classroom for science labs. We cur currently do not have any labs to teach science. Uh, additional computer labs, a dedicated library, and the faculty and staff offices that I mentioned before. 
uh, in, and that was a priority in, in the design principles. Secondly, we wanted to build a sustainable building. Uh, we have uh, established as a, as a minimum criteria that we would seek LEED certification as a silver building, and this building will have, uh, uh, is being designed so at a minimum it receives silver certification. And we wanted this building to respond to the campus master plan. That master plan looked at uh, the entire campus and tried to develop a sustainable campus, not just each individual building, but the campus working together in a sustainable manner. With the legislative action this session, we have the ability to issue $25 million in tuition revenue bonds. In addition to this, the Board of Regents has authorized the issuance of system bonds so that we can fund a 100,000 square foot building, the building the size that's necessary to meet the needs of our campus. Uh, Dr. Price will speak to the enrollment growth and the needs on our campus. Thank you very much, uh, Rich. Um, members of the board, Mr. Chairman, it's always a pleasure to uh, meet with you. Our building is needed, as Mr. Escalante has uh, already indicated, for the future growth and prosperity of our, of our campus. That anticipated growth uh, includes uh, work that we're currently doing with the community college systems in the area in order to increase the transfer rates uh, to a four-year university. Our work with our new unit of college readiness and academic success will yield important gains in enrollment as well. We also have an initiative with the Dallas uh, Independent School District with an early college high school project. And we've had phenomenal success with the Go Center that we just established in at our campus in the 2008-2009 academic year that will carry over to the subsequent academic year as well. We need the building space for laboratory classrooms to launch our life sciences and the science requirements of the core to also meet the adequate facilities requirements for SACS accreditation and to accommodate the additional faculty and staff that we were authorized to hire in the recent legislative session. In 2000, when our campus began in the business park on Hampton Road on a lease facility, we had 200 students in headcount with a 55 student full-time equivalency. In 2008, we grew that enrollment to 2,300 students approximately in headcount, and we met the 1,000 FTE requirement. In 2010, when we opened as the University of North Texas at Dallas, I anticipate that our enrollment in headcount will be close to 3,000 uh, headcount students with approximately 1,350 in full-time equivalent students. I also remind you that the University of North Texas at Dallas will be a four-year institution when it opens in 2010 and see we are seriously at work on recruiting our freshman class for 2010. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Price. You can see from the slide uh, before you and the materials you have uh, some of the facts about the building, and I won't go into to all of those, but just be ready to answer any questions you might have concerning them. Slide. Uh, this slide shows a layout of the of the of the three floors of this building. Uh, classrooms, seminar rooms, and study areas are across from faculty offices, and this is done by design. It's done by design to bring the faculty and the students together on a regular basis. We don't have uh, separate areas for different departments. We don't have a separate floor for, for faculty offices. We've, we've combined the faculty offices and the classrooms and seminar rooms to encourage contact between the faculty and, and the students. Uh, the, the, the building as proposed has, has two floors, and two full uh, floors, and uh, the third floor, the north uh, wing and the uh, west wing uh, will be constructed. The east wing will only be two floors, and uh, you notice that the east wing will have a green roof that will be an environmental green roof. Uh, not only does that to make good environmental sense, but uh, we want to have access to that roof so students can actually see how we're tying the environment into our building construction. And so we think that will not only be environmentally wise, but also a learning tool. I can address other sustainability issues uh, if you have questions. Uh, we are committed to minimum LEED uh, certification for this project. Um, but we just don't stop there. We look at uh, opportunities to, to even exceed that. Uh, the next chart shows uh, the funding uh, sources and the cost. Uh, Dr. Price and I are here uh, to answer any questions you may have. If you go back to that first slide. 
And the, the first slide shows, shows uh, our architect's rendering of, of the design of the, first, of, of the second building. And uh, we're very proud of uh, the work that, uh, that Overland uh, Architects have done on this project. And, uh, and we would uh, like the endorsement of the coordinating board so we could move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for uh, Vice Chairman Escalante or President Price? One question, Mr. Chairman. How much um, cost over and above normal construction does the LEED certification cost? And do you make that up over in, in energy savings over a period of time? We generally budget about 2% additional for LEED certification. Uh, and but we, we look at this as part of the integrated planning process. So we will look at at opportunities to to get a return. We just did we're we're finishing up a, a life science building and, and we only did made one improvement under LEED that uh, did not have a a payback period shorter than seven years. So there are many opportunities under the LEED program to get a return. When you're building a building that's going to last 50, 75 years and longer, if you can get a return in, in seven years, that really is positive. Uh, we do a number of things uh, uh, in, our, in our program uh, that, is, that is required by LEED, but, but we believe even if we weren't following the LEED program that we would do, and that is in the area of commissioning. Uh, tremendous amount you've heard people talk about today and we've you've heard us talk about about uh, our, our heating and cooling systems and and the tremendous costs they have on on the uh, on the campuses and uh, by doing commissioning we have experts involved in the efficiency efficient design of our heating and ventilating systems from the initial planning through final checkout when we turn the building over to the campus and so all of those things contribute to, to significant savings. Uh, the one thing that I can point to on, on, on in this plan that, that, that is, is, is ties the academic to, to the building design is that green roof. Uh, the other thing that is incorporated in this design is uh, on the north roof, uh, when you saw that slide and it, it, it's under your cover, it's at an angle. It angles to the south because that, build, that roof will be ready to accommodate solar panels at the appropriate angle to maximize their efficiency. We don't have solar panels incorporated in this plan, but it's being designed to incorporate those if we can find the funding source for, for that. So long answer, I'm sorry, but we're excited about the LEED program. We think it has a, a real positive impact both financially and environmentally on, on our campuses. Yeah, what, what is the return, do you know? This, what, what is the financial return on it? You mentioned seven years. We, we, we usually don't uh, accept, uh, pro accept changes that are, are less than, than seven years. In the long period, uh, the long life, you mean in the life of the building, what is the return? Well, I was trying to get a, a feel for how much more it costs to do the LEED certification and how quickly you make that back. We, we believe we make it back in less than seven years. Good question, and uh, I think it, it, there was a study that was, came out in some of the construction industry journals a couple months ago on exactly that topic. And did I have the foresight to send that to you, Susan? I don't remember getting <laughs> that one. <laughs> well, if I can dig it out, the Chairman, uh, Vice Chairman uh, Escalante's comments are pretty consistent with what I recall from that study that the silver level certification is approximately a two percent. Yeah, and, that, I, and there is a payback. And there's a payback pretty quickly, which I, I think if we can bring that up and we want to encourage more people to do it. Any other questions? The, um, the proposed project meets all but one of our standards. Uh, the standard that does not meet is the space needs standard. There is a, a surplus of 6,754 square feet, uh, but a uh, satisfactory plan uh, has been submitted to staff. Uh, are the uh, Modulars or the or the trailers part of that surplus? 
We hope, do we hope to get rid of those trailers as soon as we open the building? <laughs> the answer is when this building opens, the, the buildings the open. will disappear. Those, so. those trailers will not be included in any calculations. I, just, I didn't know whether the trailers were part of our... I, I prefer to refer to them as modulars. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think your vice chairman was trying to elicit the sympathy of the committee. But I, I, I know what kind of buildings you're talking about. <laughs> Uh, and portables. portables, there you go. Uh, portables. <laughs> that always sounded bad. Yeah, yes, those yeah. can be built out of concrete. Uh, the modular. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> staff recommends, uh, I didn't mean to shove a commercial in there. Staff recommends <laughs> approval of the evaluation. Uh, are there any further questions? If not, the chair will. Entertain a motion. I'd like to say congratulations to the institution as well, and this is certainly an exciting time to have the construction of the second building, so I, I would like to enthusiastically make the motion. Second. Second, with I'm sure equal enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. All right, the motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. <coughs> all right. Uh, before we start item 2G, we have a surprise off the menu presentation by uh, Mike Ellicott. With, Thanks, uh, sir. I'm Mike Texas Ellicott, Tech. Vice Chancellor of Facility Planning and Construction at Texas Tech. And we have a tradition of recognizing outstanding performance wherever we find it. So, Jennifer, if you could come forward. Uh, I had a little <laughs> athletics project that I needed uh, the award <laughs> for prompt project processing. And I had a little athletic project that needed a lot of prompt project processing. Thank you. And uh, Jennifer did a superb job. So, along with this highly coveted award, comes a smile and a handshake from Thank the vice president. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to tell you how prompt she was, but Susan said I can't because it will establish false expectations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike. She Great did it job. very quickly and over her lunch hour. So, uh. Thank you, Jennifer, for proving what an efficient agency this is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, now, moving on to agenda item 2G, uh, the annual report on progress toward closing the gaps by 2015 is going to be discussed today. You received two closing the gaps report uh, documents. The first is an updated version of last year's report with the addition of actions designed to help achieve the goals and targets. This report covers all our CTG goals and objectives. The second document is a revised draft of the participation section. Uh, it has fewer numbers but more analysis of what the data tells us about factors influencing our progress. Uh, the analysis portion also identifies topics where further research is needed or where additional focus is deserved. The revised document raises issues that will be incorporated in the accelerated action plan to be presented at our board meeting in October. And Susan, you're going to present this along Good. with Janet Binky. Right. right. Janet's going to start us off, and then I will chime in when we get more or closer to the accelerated. And I think you're also looking for our feedback about the we differences are. between the two documents. So. Okay. Janet, welcome. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Uh, as, as was just mentioned, first I'm going to talk about where we are in relation to the Closing the Gaps goals and targets. Everything in these slides will be things that you've already seen, but it's just to serve as a reminder so that as we go forward with this conversation, you'll know where we're currently at. And then the other two uh, parts, as Mr. Heldenfeld mentioned, are the discussion of which of the two versions of the report you prefer, or if you have any comments, some combination of the two, and also ending up then with the accelerated action plan. Next slide. Um, the, the closing the gaps goal for the state for participation is to add 630,000 more new students. And here is a slide that shows where we currently are. We're just below the um, trend line for, for enrollment increases. And as uh, you probably remember, this trend line is set based on 5.7% of the population. That's how we arrived at those numbers. In, in uh, 2008, we were about 5.4% of the total population enrolled in higher education. And that's the, the highest level we've ever had since we have started closing the gap. So that's actually a positive thing, even though we're slightly below the trend line. Um, this 
this shows where we're what we're doing with the African American enrollment. You can see we're actually above the trend line and have been every pretty much ever since the start of closing the gaps. That's that's a very good sign. Um, in in 2000, when closing the gap started, the in percent of the population enrolled in in higher ed for African Americans was 4.6 percent. It's now at 5.6 percent. That makes them the group with the highest overall percent of the population enrolled in higher education. Next slide. Uh, the, the white slide, slide for white enrollment is a little bit unusual looking. Uh, first of all, I'll explain why the red line looks so unusual. When we did a reexamination of the closing the gaps uh, targets in, in 2005, we were at 5.6 percent of the population, of the white population enrolled in higher education. In order to make uh, some progress possible, before the 2010 target, that target, which had been 5.4 percent, was raised to 5.6 to 5.7 percent. So you can see that really changed the the trend line. Uh, even so, we uh, are now slightly below the trend line, and uh, the percent of the population currently enrolled for the whites is 5.5 percent. Next slide. Um, now we'll look at the Hispanic enrollment, you can see we're considerably below what the trend line is there. We're currently at 4.0 percent of the population enrolled in higher education. That's, that's up slightly from the 3.6 percent that was enrolled in, in the year 2000 when closing the gap started. Um, but when you look at this line, you actually miss some of the very positive things that have been happening with Hispanic enrollment. For example, the number of Hispanic students graduating from high school and going on to higher education has increased quite a bit. In uh, 2000, about 34 percent of the population of the, those recent high school grads went on to higher ed. Now it's up to 45 percent. So that's a pretty substantial increase. And next slide. This is another way of looking at the increase in the Hispanic enrollment. Each of those bars represents the annual change, so it's a year-to-year -year change, and it'll be cumulative over time. With the exception of white enrollments between 2001 and 2002, you can see that Hispanic enrollment has been the highest in terms of the increase in enrollment all the years of closing the gap. So another very positive thing that's going on with Hispanic enrollment. And we've had 130,000 more Hispanic students enroll in higher education since closing the gap started. Next slide. And just uh, a quick summary. The one thing I'll add is that the number of dual credit students has really increased. They have contributed 22% to the, the growth in higher education enrollment since the start of closing the gaps. Next slide. And moving on to the success area, our, tar our goal here is to increase the number of awards to 210,000. Next slide. And for the, the goal really is related to the bachelor's associate and certificate level degree programs. And so here you see for those three types of awards <coughs> where, where we are. And we're just pretty much continuing in pace with the trend line. And the next slide will show you where we are for the, mat, the bachelor's and associate's degrees. Once again, pretty much just on pace to uh, meet the goals if we keep up our current level of progress. And moving on to Hispanic uh, undergraduate awards, you can see we're just slightly below the trend line, and that's a, a positive sign, even though it's flattening just a bit. Okay. Uh, African American awards for undergraduates are um, also flattening, and as you can see, really since 2004, they haven't really changed a lot. So this is a source of, of concern for us. The one area where we do have lots, lots of progress to report is the area of doctoral degrees awarded. And you can see we're well below, above the trend line and well on our way to meeting the, the closing the gaps target of 2015. No, you don't have that slide. That one got added at the last yeah. minute. Yeah. I, I just realized I hadn't put that one in there. So I <laughs> need to. They got added this morning, so it didn't mm -hmm. get printed. So. 
Okay. Uh, now moving on to the critical field areas where we've set targets because they're important areas for the state. And the first one we're going to look at is the technology area. These are the STEM fields of science, oh, well, technology, engineering, and math. And um, we're well below the trend line. In fact, we've made very little progress since the start of closing the gaps. And you'll give, get some more details on the next slide. This shows you by the, the various components of the, the overall technology awards where we are. We've increased the number of engineering degrees awarded about 30 percent since the start of closing the gaps. But in contrast, the number of computer science awards has decreased by not quite 30 percent. And the other two, the physical sciences and the math components, haven't, haven't changed very much at all. Now, I've, I looked at the numbers related to bachelor's degrees at the national level to see how Texas compared. And engineering uh, has been up. In fact, all of these areas are up at the national level for the whole period. But uh, computer science degrees peaked in about 2004, about like they did for us, and then they've been decreasing since then. But that's just the bachelor's. Uh, this includes certificates and associate degrees as well. And in fact, in, in the area of computer science, a good portion of the numbers you see up there are coming from programs at, at two-year institutions. Okay. Uh, uh, second critical field area is allied health and nursing. This is one where we also changed the, or the board actually, changed the, the trend line uh, because the original goal in closing the gaps was just to stop the number of degrees from decreasing so rapidly. That was actually accomplished in the first few years of closing the gaps and so, uh, and there were some legislative programs that made a lot of difference. So the increase started and we raised the, the totals that would be required to meet closing the gaps. We're still on target, but um, this is the combination of both allied health and nursing. In, in some other board meetings, you've had reports on the the nursing strategic plan that's coming from the Association of Nurses and some other groups, and they actually recommend a much higher number of nurses for the future. Uh, so that will need to be examined, and perhaps our target will need to be raised even more for this goal. Another very, very critical area for the state is teacher education. You can see that we're behind on both of these goals. And it's, it's one of the most important for preparing students to be ready for college when they enter higher ed. Um, so we're, we're also very concerned about this topic. And just a, a wrap up of where we are. Next, next slide. Moving on to excellence, the, the goal is to increase the number of nationally recognized programs. And I decided to, no, normally we compare with California at this point in time, but I thought, well, we've done that so many times, so I'll do something a little bit different. I've looked at our, our two tier one institutions' progress towards increasing their stature based on uh, the evaluation of a number of different reports. And both the U.S. News and World Reports rankings and the Center for Measuring University Performance have both UT Austin and Texas A&M decreasing slightly or staying about the same in, in their rankings. So they're not really increasing. On the other hand, the Washington Monthly rankings, which um, are from 2007 and 2005, the ones that are shown there, um, show Texas A&M as the number one ranked <coughs> institution in 2007. Those rankings are based on social mobility, so it's a little bit different approach than the other ranking groups. They also do include things like research and things like that, but uh, participation in ROTC is one of the things in which they rank. Social mobility, aren't you referring to public service? And uh, They also have public service in there, yes. The number of people who go on to the Peace Corps is one of the things they rank on. And like the other measures, they do have a predicted and an actual component for the graduation rate for students that they look at as part of it. They also look at the number of students on Pell Grants. Well, clearly the Washington Monthly must have more credibility. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, it'll be interesting to see. They say they're getting ready to put out a 2009 report, so I'll, we'll update you <laughs> on where where everybody ranks. So we hope uh, A and M will be doing equally as well. And. The uh, accountability groups have been talking about excellence during this past year. We've often mentioned to you that the language that's in the excellence measures is rather vague. We're waiting for the final version of the, the accountability group's reports in order to perhaps make some changes to our closing the gaps measures. Equally importantly, those their comments will be used to perhaps change some of the accountability <coughs> excellence measures as well. And uh, the real intent is to make the excellence goals and targets more quantifiable so that we'll have a better way of being able to measure what really is excellence and quality. And that's very hard to do. Uh, moving on to research. The, the goal for the state is to increase our percent of federal R&D obligations for science and engineering to 6.5 percent of that which is given out to states uh, nationally. So. This slide shows you where we are. We were at 3.5 percent when closing the gap started. We're now at 5.3 percent. Oh, <laughs> we're now at 5.5 percent. Uh, you can see there the states that are ahead of us. We really haven't made much significant progress on this topic. Uh, next slide. Where we have made some progress is on total research expenditures, which will include federal expenditures and others like private expenditures or uh, public state funds, things like that. And the goal here was to have uh, $3 billion in research funding by 2015. We've already met that goal. Another thing that may uh, impact the future of of the amount of research funding that's coming to the state is the stimulus package. And you can see there that NIH, which has always been one of the most important parts of federal research funding for states, is anticipated to receive uh, $10 billion in the, as part of the stimulus package. The National Science Foundation is scheduled to get $3 billion. Okay. So that's, that's the end of the report on where we are in each of the Closing the Gap's goals and targets. And now we'll move on to the versions of the Closing the Gap's report that you received. So um, as Mr. Heldenfels mentioned, we, we had one full report that was similar to the report that was done um, last year. And then we also sent you a version, a different version of the participation section. This was uh, changed at at Dr. Gardner's suggestion that we put more in there that would give more analysis of, of the measures. Uh, do you have those documents? You should. You didn't bring them. You should have them in front of you, I believe. So this is the traditional report yep. updated, and this is the, the new version had the, the cover this sheet. This is kind of a cover sheet to explain why you had two versions of the same thing. So we're interested in your, your thoughts on which of these versions you think uh, is the most useful both to you and to perhaps the public generally if they're going to be looking at closing the gaps and wondering how we're doing. You want that feedback now or do you yes. want to? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Committee members? Or you, if you don't want to do it now, you're welcome to think about it and let us know. We'll be preparing a final report to send to the full board for discussion at the July meeting. And so uh, let, we need Let me point out one thing I, yeah. I, I saw and I don't know if the board would have the same concern, but uh, as I read the report, and it, you know, it hadn't changed much over the years, it seemed to me to be a blur of numbers. And I don't, I didn't think that we, it necessarily focused in on some that were important. And I, uh, I one change you see, if you look at African Americans here, for example, uh, our basic numbers suggest, and, and it's true that we're doing well in terms of uh, our targets in terms of African American uh, participation, well in terms of our our, uh, the number of graduates, but as you look at the data in more detail, you note at the, the bottom of the page, Janet has pointed out that we're doing very poorly with African American males. So even though we're meeting our targets, there's an opportunity to dramatically increase success and in participation in terms of African American males. Now, you know, I, I'm not sure if this is, is where the analysis should, analysis should be, but I think this addresses part of what you need to do as you go forward in terms of what what can we kickstart? So, you know, I think there can be more analysis in terms of, of success in particular, 
uh, where can you what can you do if you achieve uh, graduation rates? I was just looking for one cohort of, of African Americans in general, but uh, a cohort of, of I think from 2002 there were about 6,000 African Americans. Uh, it's about a 38 percent graduation rate. Uh, about five percent point change would have been about 600 more graduates alone. So, uh, so I think what I was hoping to do, and whether this is the right format or not, is to give you more targeted information overall. How well are we doing? But, but where are the opportunities to go forward? And 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 so that was the attempt. If, if uh, you know, you'd like some other direction, or if you like the report in the form, it it it, 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 it always been, it's done, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> but we're trying to anticipate some of the analysis that you're going to need over the next few months and going forward. In, in a, two comments. In a nutshell, I did like the revised format better, um, with with one exception as to what I would add. I I think that the summary pages in the front of the report that we've been getting. Are useful because it, right there you've got all 18 yeah. goals and their status. I agree with that. On one page, followed by a, a page or so, page and a half of summary of findings. So the the italicized page numbers, in other words, right, you know, might be mm -hmm. added to the front of the revised right. presentation. Um, the uh, so that that's really, I think, my main. I, I think that would happen. They just did one section. And in fact, I was surprised they they did it as quickly. As we did, you know, I got this report when we went to Denver for the Lumina meeting, and, and when I got back, we sat down and talked about it. So they turned this part around very quickly, uh, really over a weekend. Uh, so, so I appreciated that effort. The only thing I might add is, is uh, you know, highlighting any of our uh, goals or objectives that need to be redefined. If statistics are showing we need to reset something, like you know, nursing, we, we're we're above the trend line on nursing, although it's about to take a upward steep slope. If that has to be made even more steep, you know, then that should be and called we, out in the report. And we would add that as part of that. That would be the further analysis part that you would get in the new versus what you're getting in the current version of how we've been doing closing the gap. We might call it out by boxing it as a proposed change. Or, okay. Or um, any further comments on this, Mr. Chairman? Okay. Um, you know, just for the uh, committee members, um, I think you all have got the notice that we're going to try to meet to have a, a uh, workshop on the 29th. And, and the purpose of that workshop is not to drill down to 5,000 feet. The purpose of that workshop is to try to really um, put together a template for this last half of closing the gaps and maybe even beyond then as to what we need to focus on from a strategic planning process. And the thought then is then the fall we'll have the strategic planning process. I had not seen this. I, if I did, it's in on papers my desk. So I, I think I did not get it since I'm an official member of the committee. But um, I really just glanced at it. I like this format better, uh, David. I, I think the data is still important for us to have as a board, but it helps us to really you know, hone into this. I, I would also say I just think that, um, you know, David, you know, whether it was at um, Lumina and Denver that we were at together or whether it was um, uh, we had a great meeting with superintendents um, uh, last week or I kind of get my days run together. <laughs> um, but it was a great meeting because I heard some, you know, some really what I thought were uh, creative ideas thrown out there. I mean, one of the ideas we heard, for instance, by the superintendents, and I heard this the night before, uh, just meeting with about two or three of them the next day, was the whole issue of, you know, a huge challenge we've got is math and science teachers right mm -hmm. now. And the question is, uh, several of those superintendents said, you know, our, our requirements to get a degree for math today is way too stringent. They said, what we'd love to see is to see, you know, you really only have to have Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Geometry, and I'm, I'm showing the ignorance here from public ed, but the question is, can we design a baccalaureate program that is not so overburdensome where we can encourage more people to, to pursue that type of degree? So I'd love to see us, 
you know, when we get into the strategic plan to really think about because to me that's a that's an issue that we really as a board can have an impact in and trying to to shape. We and and I was in a meeting the other day with higher ed, ed uh, 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 president as well as a community college uh, president, and I saw a lot of affirmation as that was brought up. So. Um, I just encourage us, we think through this, some of those key ideas that we've heard, how do we drill down into those and really put those as um, uh, part of the tactical issues that we look at. Uh, but, but the thought is for this committee is, you know, I think five years ago we used to get this report and everybody's eyes would glaze over and it's kind of like, well, what do we do next? And I, I think, I don't think, I, the goal that that uh, Fred and Elaine and I have talked about is really in the strategic planning process is to really be very, very tactical in how we lay this out for the next, you know, seven or eight years. And Lynn, that kind of ties into some of the comments you made to me and the email you sent to me. So, so I, I think the abbreviated format helps us get more intense uh, Good. focus on what we need to do. Next what, Elaine? Absolutely, and, and going along those lines, I, I realize this is a progress report, but I think what would be helpful in reviewing some of these documents, um, the observations and the analysis are great, and it's they're very they're embedded within a large number of words and a large number of observations and, and analysis. But what would be helpful is to be able to break these out in a more tactical fashion that says what can P12 do, and how does the coordinating board help P12? What, what does the transition between high school, community college, and uh, higher ed institutions, what can they do and what should they be focused on? And then what, what policies does the coordinating board need to put in effect to help the continuum overall? It would be very, I think, helpful to be able to identify the strategies broken out along that pipeline and continuum so that the superintendents can say, ah, you know, we need this policy done here, baccalaureate and mathematics teaching, for example, um, and we know what our responsibility is and what our go-do is on, on that regard. But they're all meshed with, and I realize this is a progress report, but they're all kind of meshed within a large body of text. It'd be nice to have them. It's point. coming. It's coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe not in this report, but. <laughs> sort of the next it's, step, it's, I think. Yeah, and, and, and I don't know if it's it's broken out by audience because one of my questions was who is this document for? If this document is just um, if it's targeted for the pu for the public, um, uh, is there a parents section that we need? Um, if it's targeted for P12, how c what can we break out such that we garner their help and we are helpful to them? That kind of thing. I think and, that's a, a really good point that you guys need to talk about because I think. That number one, you're going to want another document that really is your kickstart document that will address part of that. But even within that, you may want some some uh, other dark documents that are targeted for particular populations, mm -hmm. so they can get to it quickly. So for the schools, for the superintendents, uh, for the parents, but that would be embedded in the overall part of the overall document in a clear fashion that you're talking about. I think at this point. Um, I think the staff has begun to pinpoint some areas you want to look at without the specific strategies really clearly identified at this point. And I think that's something that you guys are going to have to weigh in on. And, and uh, that's on the upcoming slides. Yeah. How so with that segue. <laughs> I, yeah. So, I you know the accelerated has... action plan is in there in regards, but if this is a communication piece, I think we ought to look and, at it. And this right is meant for the general public at this point. Here we. Here's where we said we wanted to be for closing the gaps, and here is where we currently are. And then it does kind of hear some issues and concerns. And then this action plan, I think that the accelerated action plan probably gets closer to what you're wanting as far as here's some very specific things that we want to do or we think that can get us there. And then Janet has something that's not on here, that a draft that she has given me that very definitely says, okay, here's the project, here's the implementers, what role does the coordinating board have in this? And that is something that Janet has done a draft of, it's kind of modeled after something that uh, Mr. Heldenfeld had given us that talks about the different projects and that sort of thing. And I think that's probably closer to what 
I you're just looking at given one. given comments on this particular document that's all uh -huh. I'm, I'm saying is some of these observations and analysis could probably be broken out to be more meaningful put okay. them in context as to where they belong okay. if, if that makes sense the other thing is that I think some of these target sentences are misleading um, one would hope that you take the target sentence and you look at the graph and you see that yeah you know the Hispanic population of Texas grew from 3.7 to 4.8 and is supposed to grow to 5.7 by 2015. What it doesn't say is that we are way below the targets. And, and this target, know, yeah, and this target segment is the exact target segment out of closing the gaps. Okay, and so that's, that's right. That's where we pulled that from and that's the overall kind of target for Hispanics. And hopefully we get into the... I'm just not sure we need behind. another sentence that says, by the way, you were woefully behind. To the next okay. thing has the status, the very next. Yeah, this. On page four. The maybe very maybe next we need a well headline below, below the, the target that makes that point. Yeah, you okay, know, so. because in some of these slides, slides as well. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, we recognize that there's a, there's a need to hit a balance between the progress made but also, you know, focusing on the gap yet to be made up mm -hmm. by 2015. And I, I think in addition to uh, the action, creating meaningful action plans to address particularly those goals that are well behind, um, I think what I'm hearing Elaine say is we need, to, we, need to, we need to also consider our audience, and it's multiple audiences. And the most efficient mm -hmm. thing is to create a single, simple enough, clear enough report that it can be shared with parents and students, institutions of higher education, public school districts, P-16 councils, and the general public, and even the legislature. Uh -huh. uh, and that that one document can be understood by all those constituents. Especially folks who can make a difference. Those who, you know, are decision makers and, and assigners of tasks, if you will, that can make a difference and help us in this. Well, maybe we ought to have a breakout after each one of these of, uh, I don't know what you would call it, of, you know, partnership actions, the partnership next steps or mandates or whatever, something like that. I know it's, that's what our chairman uh, is going to have us talk about on the 29th, but um, just giving a little comment mm -hmm. on this, this report here. So. One, one thing I'd like to add to, um, this may be a bigger change in the organization than we want to do, but if you're trying to, in my opinion, if you're trying to come up with a more succinct report that any audience could read, I think it would be really helpful to have your participation goal and then your success, your participation target and your success target next to one another for each ethnicity group. Because when you look at the participation target for African Americans, it looks like we're doing exceptional. But then when you look at the success target, we're well below where we need to be with the certificates and baccalaureate awards. And I think that's an important distinction to make, that yes, we're getting kids here, but they're not finishing with their degrees. And that might be a good snapshot for the public to see or um, higher ed institutions and community colleges to see clearly. I think that's an important thing to highlight. It's a good thought, sort of a horizontal presentation of the, of the goals by, by kids. Those that are up, Fruit. those that are down. That's right. You know get a picture at a glance. That, yeah. that will be a little bit of a challenge because there isn't always a corresponding one. So I, I think it could be done, but we're going to have to think about how to do that. There isn't a core. In each case, there isn't a corresponding success target. In some cases, we have success targets where there isn't a participation, such as with the or the teaching and, and whatever. But well, I noticed figure out how to do that because they are connected. And Yeah, and yeah. One has to drive the in other. In fact, it's one thing that... that you know, bothers me is that people don't realize a real connection between participation and success. Yes. That if you, you know, if it's not enough to just enroll yes. folks, you need they need to graduate. And, and in fact, that participation number can go up and down with your the level of success with the students once they get in. Because if they stay for one semester, right. they don't count. Well, we'll talk more about that and, and some of the upcoming items because that's going to be part of our formula funding charges and our yeah. legislative review. Um, well, Janet, why don't you go on and, okay. and go through these last and, slides. And we and definitely explain. will take your comments into consideration and try to do as much as we can to make this report um, somewhat more responsive. It may not get all the way there. It may be a work in progress, especially as we start moving on to 
the accelerated action plans and after those are available then we maybe could incorporate a few more things into this document so that you know we're slowly honing our message and making it more understandable and, and more concrete um, a quick question I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just can you tell me kind of the timeline are we going to work on the accelerated action plan on the 29th and do you want uh, comments before then or wait till then or you can give us any comments you want at any time but y'all will be talking about the accelerated action plan on the 29th and so we that's why it's going to be hard to um, incorporate all those into something that you, we have right. to send y'all for review for the 30th so that's part of I'm, Janet's I'm comment. Susan, excuse me. I was just going to comment that Janet's going to show you what the <coughs> staff is going to be doing over the next few months and part of the feedback that would be useful is where you would like to be included in the, the timeline of what the staff is doing and, and I know that she yeah. doesn't have your meeting on the 29th here but but you guys have to be involved you don't want to get something on the on September 23rd and never have seen it before so right. so how do we incorporate the 29th how much information would you like in between now and then David you know the, the, and Lynn, the thought on the 29th is um, uh, that we've talked about is and and uh, I'm in the process right now of trying to put together a template for the strategic plan um, and which um, you know I then want to share with with Raymond and David and because and get their thoughts and ideas and the thought is to get that out to the board for your independent thoughts and ideas before the 29th but the thought of the 29th is not drilling down in my mind to these details okay the 29th is really trying to put together a road map as to what we want to accomplish the strategic plan. Historically, I think our strategic planning sessions have been more update oriented than they have been action oriented. And, and the goal for it, I think is especially with three potential outgoing board members, is so that we don't leave, lose some of that institutional knowledge. Um, is to really sit down and really formulate a plan for what we want to accomplish, strategic plan. And, and part of that may be talking about what we want to do in the accelerated plan, David, and those kind of things, but there's, it's, it's, um, it's, it's really developing a roadmap for the strategic planning session in the fall is what it is. So I don't, to me, it's more of a 10,000 foot look is what it is on the 29th. And I'll be, I'd love to hear your comments, but we've, we're gonna have about three hours in there uh, to really focus on that and I think it'll take us that three hours to make sure that we stay within bounds to really from a policy making board standpoint that's in my mind the key is that we really are focused on what we want to accomplish the strategic plan and then we give the staff the ability to go back and say this is a broad picture of where we want to go with the strategic plan the areas we want to address it's almost a work plan for David y'all to come back before fall for us to be be working on putting that information together I think it will also be talking about format of, of the strategic planning session I think personally we need an outside facilitator um, that we hire independently to come in and facilitate that to, that keeps us on track <laughs> so you know we you know that we don't drill down to 1,000 feet that we we really focus on the next eight years what do we need to do tactically as well as policy-wise for the state of Texas and higher ed? So now I'm open for any suggestions, I mean, but that was that's kind of a thought process of what we will be trying to work towards on the 29th. So now be. So the overall strategic plan, not just the closing the gaps plan. You bet. I see. And really identifying what we, what we want to address on the 29th and then using the retreat in the fall to, to actually flesh out the strategic mm -hmm. plan in the next seven years. It's actually six years and seven academic years. Right. Six years from this fall is when we'll need to hit those targets. Right. And, okay, so now, now you confuse me again when you say hit these targets. We're, we are going to focus on the closing the gaps plan or on the overall strategic plan for the <coughs> statewide higher ed strategic planning? Well, closing, I think, we're going to, what I think our chairman was saying is that on the 29th, we're going to talk about what our key, uh, what our key areas are that we want to focus on in terms of the board strategic plan. Part of that, of course, a major element of that is the state strategic plan of closing the gaps. 
and what we as a board see as necessary to achieve those goals over the next seven academic years. But that, uh, I don't think that by any means is the limit of what we'll be addressing in the right, retreat. I think right. there are going to be at least two or three other major areas like uh, our messaging and branding of our higher education message to the public, to the Texas mm -hmm. public, for example. I think will be a major topic area. But on the 29th, it's set in scope. To, you want to set that scope. We want to come up with what are those four or five or however many major areas that we're going to address in our, in our more, our longer, more detailed yeah. strategic plan. In the thing that we typically call the strategic plan. Okay, well, then I think I have one more question that will help me understand exactly how we're doing this. Um, when is this, y'all are calling it the accelerated plan? Mm -hmm. When is that going to be? ready? I mean, what's the process? And that's what Janet is just getting ready oh, to okay. explain to you. All right, great. And, and what Janet is explaining is um, what the staff is is in the process of doing currently. Okay. Because we've kind of gotten started on that. Well, let's go through that, these last few slides, and then okay. we'll follow up with any final questions. Good. Okay, these are the areas that we're going to be concentrating on for the accelerated action plan. They're the areas where we're the most behind the targets. They're Hispanic participation, STEM graduates, initial teacher certifications, nursing graduates, and federal research obligations. Okay, and the way the staff is handling this, we're, we've developed staff teams and they're cross-divisional teams. Everybody's pretty excited about being able to work on important topics. Of course, we're all working on them all the time, but uh, to, to bring people from so many different areas together and work together is going to be a really important part of the process. They will each be preparing draft reports. And they're going to concentrate on strategies and actions that will help us achieve the goals, which means they have to be, as the commissioner says, kind of low-hanging fruit where you can actually make a big difference within a fairly short period of time. And each of the committees is going to have a data person on there. That's kind of the side I come from. And they will be able to provide them any additional data resources or help them delve into what might be happening in certain areas that might be going to be causing things to happen. And they're also going to talk about using the best practices that are identified from the really best of the URRS reports, Uniform Recruitment and Retention Strategy reports, to include and perhaps suggest that other uh, institutions adopt. And a little more, we're going to be looking both at the state level, but we'll look at regional levels and institutional levels if we think that's an important part of the process. And we're going to include only the major things that the coordinating board does now or, or we are going to recommend for the future. There's so many things that we do every day, you know, thousands of reports that we do and questions that we answer. We can't delve into all of those, but we're going to concentrate on the really big picture items. And we'll add in any major measures that were changed or added by the 81st legislature. Um, we're going to use this as a process to connect projects and results, and we're going to try to use it also as we go forward, not as a, a one-time document, but that's something that can be changed as time goes by. If we suggest something and, and as the evaluation comes in, it's not as strong as we would hope or it needs to be changed, then we can make those modifications to these action plans. Um, we're going to attempt, we're going to have the plans to you for your next committee meeting. We're going to, the teams have already been formed. Some of them have started meeting. They're going to prepare their plans and submit them to uh, Dr. Gardner and the commissioner by the middle of August. And they will be reviewing them internally. And then they'll go to you in time for you to review before your next meeting. Well, th that's the point where I think you know, I'm a little concerned about you not having some involvement prior to, to that uh, and, and how you would like to do that. Uh, I mean, I think you don't want to end up with a plan if your place is on September 23rd and not have had any input into it previously, I don't think. Uh, so I, I just think that's something we don't need an answer now, but I think it's something to, to think about because I know many of you have ideas. Uh, part of it, Janet has put up some basic questions, but I think 
the process works well, what will happen is people began to review existing efforts, began to review numbers, that there are going to be some turns that are made as we go forward in the summer that we might discover some opportunity to, that, for some action that isn't currently recognized. And we, we just don't know that, but we have to anticipate that that, that may be, or that we realize some of our efforts that, that uh, we've discussed yesterday aren't contributing as much as, as we thought. Well, you've got uh, five separate teams working on these five accelerated action plans, is right. that correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Are any, are any of them further along than the other? Well, they have just, just started meeting. The Hispanic team has divided into four subgroups to, to try to deal with different kinds of topics like the younger students coming in, older, attracting old, older students, uh, working with communities, and things like that. So they're probably furthest along, but uh, and in some ways maybe nursing's even further along, even though they've only met once, but there is this nursing strategic plan that they will be able to build their action plan on. But what I would suggest is, is maybe as a step in that direction is it's, uh, it would probably be helpful for both the board members and also for David and Raymond if instead of giving getting all of these in mid-August, is if we could stage these and perhaps if uh, the Hispanic participation team and or the nursing uh, graduates team could have even a rough draft of, of theirs available to us a few days before we meet on the 29th, we would at least get a sense of where you're headed with format um, and um, you know how, how impactful and how living you know the document will be as a tool. Um, and we can get at least we can maybe provide some feedback. I know the purpose of the 29th is not to do a, a big, you know, we don't want to drill down, as, as Chairman Ryder said, into the details, but at least we could give you, you know, a surface level bit of feedback, even if it's uh, literally just a page out of each plan. I think what they right. might be most likely to do is sort of their current thoughts or issues that they've identified at that point in terms of potential directions. Um, maybe not have in mind the current format because that, that's. Yeah. That's not quite as important, but really, here, here's some areas that they think may have potential, and that they're looking at, and, and, and as you see them, it may, you may get some ideas. Uh, you, the, um, you, you guys decide what you need our feedback on, you know, most importantly, and, and mm -hmm. uh, at a fairly high level. The only reason I mentioned format is that, uh, as a working document, as a, the, the only important format has, is if it helps make clear the actions of the responsibilities and the deadlines. Yeah. As long as it does that, then, you know, I don't care. That's good. Any other comments or questions? Susan, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, huh? All right. Janet, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll move on to item, agenda item 2H, um, <clears throat> consideration of recommendations to the board for approval nominated members of the Formula Funding Advisory Committee for the 2012-2013 biennium. Uh, you've got a supplemental agenda item on this one. It's the goldenrod covered sheets. Um, and uh, the change occurred because one of our institutions, Lamar State, uh, requested a change in their nominee. And Gary Johnston is here to uh, discuss not only how the members are selected, but also uh, get our input for charges to this committee. Gary? Okay. Uh, before we talk about the committee members, I wanted to uh, briefly uh, talk about the process for formula funding. Uh, statutorily, the coordinating board is required to make a recommendation to the LBB and to the governor's office uh, by June of um, uh, 2010 for uh, formula. And for that is the process and also for a level of funding that uh, is necessary. The goal of the formula process is to come up with a fair and equitable, equitable way of distributing general revenue that the state provides for higher education. Uh, next slide. Uh, the timeline for this process is that we will start in August uh, with the uh, committee members that the, that the board approves July 30th. We will start at meeting with the committees in August and we will meet with them uh, 
regularly during the fall and and uh, ask them to complete their report uh, by the end of December to be distributed to the board in, in um, and reviewed by staff and then distributed to the board for the April meeting to adopt the recommendation. A uh, couple of things that we will be doing differently this time. In the past, we have had cost studies for the community colleges and the general academics. We'll also be developing a cost study for the health-related institutions as a result of the legislation for the 80 in the 81st legislature. Uh, the formula uh, recommendation comes from the cost study, and the cost study is uh, develops the rates and matrix for um, for the formula. I'd also like to uh, tell you a little bit about the way the funding is was uh, as a result of our last recommendation. We um, we made some recommendations to the legislature uh, and the governor, and I believe you have a handout, a, a table with the detail of those recommendations, and uh, this will show you how well our recommendations were funded in uh, this legislation legislative session that's just completed. Uh, just a reminder, the. For the community college and the general academics, our recommendation was for a phase-in of, of completed and attempted hours for consideration. And the funded model for the 2010-11 biennium is on attempted only. So if you look at community colleges, uh, their biennial general revenue is slightly less than $2 billion. This is an overall increase of 164 million or 9% increase in formula funding. And 76% of the board's recommendation was funded. Uh, part of that 9% is to cover enrollment growth. There was a 7% enrollment growth between the uh, last biennium to this biennium that was part of that funding. Now for the universities, their funding for the bi upcoming biennium is 4.3 billion. It's an overall increase of 6%. Their base year change in semester credit hours was 3.7%. So the 6% uh, funds both the growth and, and some cost increases. And 91% of the board's recommendation was funded. For the health related, uh, their biennial amount uh, for this upcoming biennium is 1.7 billion, a 16% increase over over the uh, uh, current current biennium, and uh, actually they were funded at 108% of the coordinating board recommendation. Their um, part of the their, part of the reason for that is that they had a uh, a very dramatic increase in um, full-time students. They had a 10% increase in full-time students from last ba uh, base year to the current base year. And uh, part of that reason for the higher percent of, of our recommendation funding is that uh, if you updated our recommendation to their current enrollment, it, it wouldn't have been over 100%, but uh, based on what we had in June 2008 and in our recommendation, it was greater than that. Uh, there's also trustee funds for all sectors, and that totals 77 million, and that is a um, $59 million increase over the current funding. And majority of that is in the nursing reduction program. We um, that that program received the, the greatest increase in uh, trustee amounts. Now, uh, this item, the re recommendation of committee members for the next round of formula funding uh, committees is presented in this in your agenda and as a change with the uh, supplement. 
The committees will be three committees, one for each sector. There'll be seven. We're proposing 17 members for the general academic institutions, 12 for the community and technical colleges, and each one of the health-related institutions, which there are nine, will be, have have uh, nominated uh, a representative. We have tried to balance the, our recommendation as far as our diversity by uh, geography, gender, and ethnicity. And uh, what we're asking you today is to is to recommend these these committee members to the board for for nomination. There will also be work groups that these committees will form. The Journal Academics in the past, have, their committee has formed two work groups, one to work on the instruction and operation formula and the other and another work group to work on the infrastructure formula and for the small school supplement. The community colleges have in the past not had work groups, but that doesn't mean they may not create a work group, um, a subgroup of their committee to do additional work. <coughs> We ask them to appoint their own chair of their committee. And uh, in the past, the, the staff has uh, asked one of the members to be the convening chair, and then their first um, business is that they elect their own chair. Uh, also, uh, we wanted to discuss some of the potential charges to this committee, to the three committees. And uh, I'd like to go through briefly, go through the ones that we have have uh, proposed, and also ask for your input on additional charges or any modifications of these charges that we have that we have proposed. For the general academic and for all the committees, the first charge is for them to to recommend funding levels that they feel are necessary to achieve the goals of closing the gaps. And another charge that we're going to ask all the committees to do is to is to study and make a recommendation on the best method of moving toward a more outcome-based funding formula. And, and then for the general academics in particular, we're going to ask them to make a recommendation on modifying formulas that reflect formulas for the institutional mission. Now for the health-related, we're also going to ask yeah. them to make a recommendation on talk about those first or do you want to get through all of them? Well the why don't you go through just the third recommendation on each of the other two groups? I mean, okay. The first two are the same for all categories. Yes, they are. So just hit quickly on the okay. uh, what's different about health. The health related institutions are going to need to make a recommendation on the methodology of their of their cost matrix, which is new. So that's that's that'll be a big job and uh, so that's the only recommendation we have added to theirs. Um, for the community colleges, we're going to ask them to um, talk about funding strategies for developmental education, which will in increase the effectiveness. Part of the legislation that was passed in the 81st legislature is to, there was riders attached, which uh, address developmental education, in particular for the community colleges, and that, that is to start looking at funding way, ways of funding non-course-based remediation or other types of interventions that would uh, uh, improve the effectiveness of developmental education. So I'll, I'll stop there and ask for your input on these recommendations. Let's do this in two steps. First, is there any questions on the proposed membership of the committees? And, uh, if not, the Chair would entertain a motion to approve the proposed membership for each of the three committees. Move to approve. Well, motion from Ms. Mendoza. Is there a second? Second. Second from Dr. Phillips. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Now, uh, let's talk about the charges to each of the three committees. Um, questions or feedback for, for Gary on that? Just real quick, how does this, I know, for example, the best method of moving towards a more outcomes-based formula funding was something that we were hopeful to accomplish this session. Uh -huh. um, we weren't able to, but um, was that their charge prior to the last 
moving into the last this legislative session at all? No. It was not okay. one of their charges that we assigned to them in August of 2007 uh, when we when we initially met with the committees uh, looking at attempted versus completed was not on the charge list. Okay. It was added as we got underway. Right, to get their response to and get then their we came up with the minimum, minimum level of funding, et cetera, right? Right. Okay. Um, and then back in 2007, were um, these other, are these all new, I guess I should say? The on, <laughs> on the journal academic, the institutional mission um, consideration was on the, on the charge to journal academics. And their response, uh, they did prepare a response for that charge, and they felt like that the, um, the um, matrix that is developed by discipline and by level addressed the institutional mission. That was their response. And have they always had funding levels necessary to be best achieve closing the gaps? I don't believe that it, it's been understood that they would make a recommendation on funding levels, but I don't think it was specifically in the charge. As outlined as closing the gaps. As outlined yeah. closing the gaps. It was, it was they are in statute supposed to make a recommendation of uh, funding levels. Right. But this ties it directly to closing Great. the gaps. Great. That's why I was asking the difference because mm -hmm. that's good. That's if we're difference. narrowing that focus. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any questions or feedback? Uh, just, just two other, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, things I would throw out is, is one: um, how soon will these committees convene? August nineteenth. It will be our, as we've said, is our initial um, meeting, and they will meet every month okay. through the fall. I, I would just encourage you, Gary. When, when we were in Denver, we met with nine of the states, and Ohio has just now gone to an outcome. Uh, now based funding methodology for the institutions and we didn't get a lot of detail on it but something I heard that was interesting one I'd like I think it's important that we because that was something that was not widely embraced by the institutions um, you know as we know last time that that we give some um, examples of how it's being done in other parts of the country or how might be one I think I'd like this committee to see that uh, you know, one of the things that was said there, and I think we need to get in front of it as soon as we can, is that they use a little bit different methodology for community college, uh, their community colleges than they do their general academics. And they have what are called momentum points. And, and, and it is different because of their based contact on hours State. and based upon the nature of their type of student versus the general academic. And I just think we need to get out in front of that so we can provide that type of information to the committees to be shown what's been going on so they can they've got the model that we recommended last year but i think that would would also be a, a really critical piece of information that we want to get in their hands it's possible that with it within the dollars we have left in our lumina grant i think they might be encouraged if we invited someone from ohio here and they might I they, think that's Lumina great. might pay for that person yeah. to come here and, and <clears throat> help the staff and the committee. Because I'd like okay. to understand more of the community college, because that's one area I've always been worried about in terms of we mirror general academics and community colleges. The other thing, and I don't know if it fits in here, Fred, but I know it's been one of your uh, mantras for two or three years, and it ties in, it, it's that whole issue of cost efficiencies. and. And how can we drive out more cost efficiencies? Because we we know that we, if we close the gaps, we can't do it with the amount of state funding we've. We know that's going to be there. So, I don't know if that ties in or not, David or Gary, to what's going on in the formula funding. But to me, that really needs to be a critical area. I I, I really want the board to take a very hard look at that. You know over the next year in terms of really making some sound recommendations to the legislature. I think I think it does tie in because, I mean, you can look at cost efficiency in, in more than one way. It's not just about reducing costs, but it's also about greater productivity per dollar expended. And that's where I think it, it ties in, the number of degrees produced per dollar of formula funding. Simple overriding metrics that would apply to each and every institution, uh, I think, could be in part of what you're talking about. The other thing is that I would encourage by these August 19th meetings, in addition to looking at what Ohio's doing, 
is have the data available on the progress made, even though we, we did not get completed hours implemented, institutions have made progress in terms of the percent of That's hours completed. Point. And I think we, we need to call that to the attention of the General Academics Committee and, and community colleges as well and say, you know, how much have we moved the needle, uh, both in terms of individual examples, but of course overall. And, um, and, and hopefully, what I'm hoping is these committees will gain more confidence. They were, it was controversial, and frankly, they all were worried and squawked about moving to completed hours. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no question that's what we need to do, in this, in my opinion. Uh, and, and so I think if we can focus on progress made already, there's an ability to build the comfort level with that as one of the potential changes. In, there is the potential opportunity uh, when we have our next Regents meeting in the fall to have this as a major focus at that meeting and, and maybe even bring that Ohio person into that meeting as well. And I was actually looking at some of the speakers at the Lumina meeting to think if there were some that would be worthwhile to bring to that meeting if we, if we took sort of that orientation. So uh, that's something we have to talk about further. And the Ohio model actually does, for even for the universities, has two different models, both based on outcomes, but um, yeah. for yes, the Two different types of institutions, right. Yes. You so know, that the, almost gets to the institutional mission part of this at the same time. Yeah, they're breaking their general academics out mm -hmm. in two, two different two groups. Different groups. Um, the, the other thing that was mentioned, and if y'all just follow up on this, there was, and I think it was Ohio, also that they had been given a um, mandate by the state to cut 3% out of their ING, if I remember, but my understanding was that had that could be reinvested back into the institution, David. Right. But it was, and, and I, I, it was a real blip, but it kind of piqued my, you know, interest as we heard it, so I'd like us to, you know, under, that might be another idea for us. I'm not saying it works for us, but I, and I think we can really learn from our counterparts because I think Ohio is the only state that's gone to an outcome-driven model now, David, it is. if I remember this right. Point. It's a right. this session. A lot so. of them introduced it, but Ohio, is, I believe, is the only one that got it passed. Right. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll be next. Dr. Phillips. Um, if y'all could help me think through this on the community college, something bothers me about the changes to the funding model of developmental education that will increase the effectiveness, and that language may be driven by a line item uh, as far as and it has to be that way, I don't know. Uh, so tell me if, if that's the case. There was a rider dealing with developmental ed, but I don't, I don't think this mirrors, it talks about the effectiveness of developmental ed, but you know, the language the, doesn't developmental mirror. Developmental ed believe. is, you know, when Raymond first started talking about this, he said nothing works in developmental ed. And now we've got all this money and we've got all these models of things that don't work very well. And I hate to keep re referring to this BMA, this developmental ed. It seems like what we're really talking about is, is student success and, 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 all, and new methods for looking at how students, we can retain them and get them to persist and stay in the system. And I. I hate to keep calling that process developmental ed because developmental ed is really like just a big cliff that the kids who manage to struggle out of high school, you know, fall off and only a few crawl back up. So I, I just think it's, I don't like thinking about a funding model for developmental ed. I think we ought to call it, if we can, if it's not a line item or something, we ought to call it student success or something that hints at the things we really need to do, which is get students to, you know, persist and stay in the system and what in higher ed institutions need to do. Well, I think, that, I think it's that exact concern that resulted in changing the terminology from remedial to developmental. Yeah, I mean, we just didn't go far enough. Um, uh, Lynn, in response to that, I understand your concern, I, but, and I'm, Thinking out loud, we talked a lot about developmental ed among all these 10 states a couple of weeks ago, and, and it's a huge issue. I mean, you look at Ohio, it's, it's, their issue is adult basic education, it's not even developmental ed up there. And, right. um, and I think the thing I'm not convinced of, and I, the reason I'm, I want to see, I would like to see the community college presidents have something about developmental ed in the charge is because we're funding so much money into that today, even though we cap it at 27 hours, you know, by the state, and we're getting 
I mean, what you're saying, 10 percent, 15 percent success ratio, David? I can't remember the number. Yeah, I think it's between and 10 and 15. And I guess, you know, we I think the same way we're talking about outcome-driven basis, and we talked about that up in Denver, you know, the question is, can we more creatively fund developmental ed than the way we're doing today to drive more outcome results? So however we say it, I, I think it's that. something we've got to, it's the, where you're trying to get. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm for f funding and all that, but I just think that my feeling is that it's our state's fault that we're graduating all these kids that aren't ready for college, and we have done tremendous leadership in the college readiness effort. Uh, but the implications of the words developmental ed are, are it seems to me like it sounds like the responsibility is for the, the students, you know, to develop enough to get ready to go to college. I just would like to see it as a more positive thing, student success. Let's measure the institution by the success of the students who go there. I, I don't know. I think we've been pretty powerful in leadership by choosing the right words like college readiness, uh, like the recommended high school program, things that have that really have made systemic changes and I'm just saying words are important and maybe we can get at the systemic change we want by calling it something different. Just a thought. Well, maybe yeah. you could bring that up in the group. Oh, well, well. <laughs> yes, Jen, I don't, I, I don't have a problem with that. I, I just want to make sure that the community college presence that we engage them mm -hmm. in the process as opposed to us driving out what needs to be done in developmental ed. I, I want I want those community college presidents engaged in coming to to say we want a recommendation from you, not on how we fix it, but is there, you know, I mean, can funding even be used as a methodology to improve development lab? But whether we messed you or whatever, I just think it's important to engage the community college presidents, even at a very fun, and, fundamental level. Let's let let's not forget the way that development lab is currently funded is through courses yeah and so they have to talk about if we're going to accelerate we have to talk how to fund that part of that may be funding people who are successful rather than whatever the other process is so but there are a lot of things they could discuss but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I think part of what the staff has in mind is, is, is recognizing that course based alone isn't working right. and developmental ed you have to start there because people know what that is and then maybe you end up somewhere else when you go on, but it sort of defines the <clears throat> the topic for them, and, and then they can expand it in what you're talking about. The uh, but part of the really the second one about coming up with an outcome-based funding model yeah. can apply to developmental ed. It can apply to any sure. any of the programs. Uh, we we talk about degree funding success through funding degrees, but you can also fund success of progress made by a student to become ready for college algebra and so that that's right. part of the success model the outcome model that yeah, could include, exactly. that's include that. I think one more aspect of this we heard at the superintendent's meeting last week and I don't know whether it would result in, in implications for funding but there's a real disconnect the superintendent's referred to as, as horizontal alignment and one of the aspects of that alignment was the disconnect between uh, school districts who are questioning why some of their students are being channeled into developmental ed, and they used an, an interesting example: a student that had already uh, been enrolled at A and M was, uh, you know, doing okay, making B's and C's, uh, transferred uh, for family or financial <coughs> reasons to the College of the Mainland after having passed courses at A and M, was told that they needed 12 hours of developmental ed. Now, there's a disconnect between a student that's making a 2.5 at a tier one university and a in a community college, you know, anecdotally saying, well, we need to put you in 12 hours of developmental ed, and you know, so we need to, you know, whether it's through this advisory committee or other means, we need to figure out why is that happening because if that's if that's widespread then uh, then we need to align between the public school districts, community colleges, and the general academics what's really needed. Right. Those are those 
Yeah. We talked Placing about that all yesterday. the testing stuff, yeah. right? Yeah, Bench, that's, benchmarking that. Mm -hmm. Back that's place and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That, is, that is something I think that it was, is going on right now. Is that they're looking at the current tests out there in the right. system. And this was discussed earlier. yesterday, yesterday uh, in the discussion, uh, the, the alignment of the testing and that sort of thing to, to try and get rid of that. Actually. I'd be very concerned if any of our developmental funding, developmental ed funding requirements are being driven by a profit motive rather than a need. Well, I think the best change you can make to the funding model of developmental ed is make the high schools pay for it. If their kids have to go into developmental ed, well, and you, that, you yeah. will you will hear a hue and cry for, all right, then you better prove to me it's really needed. But one problem we have with developmental ed, here's one reason it's crummy, nobody's responsible for it. Nobody's responsible. Even the community college, they're just being charitable. They're just helping out. Well, they've they've ended up being pitched the ball. Right. The community colleges have been given responsibility because uh, the high schools. Uh, you know, have social promotion in general. I know. And the general academics aren't going to do it. They're just not going to do it. You either yeah. sink or swim. Yeah. Also, by law, community colleges are open admission. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, right. Right. So they have to deal with it in that sense. But, but there is this disconnect in terms of what's the real alignment made. So, so, so Mr. Chairman, along these lines, uh, it's important that we, we kind of make sure that we're asking them to work on the charges we are asking them to work on. Uh, lead us to um, the things that we want to accomplish mm -hmm. and not asking them the same things over again or right. else right. we'll end up with the same results. So yeah. if there's anything else that we can ask of them that kind of work back from our goal, that would be nice. Rethink funding. I have a, along those lines, I have a question. The third, the, the specific goal for the General Academic Committee, um, the third goal seems kind of vague to me. So I didn't, I was going to ask for some clarity on what that would mean and along with what they've been funded, what, how that would imply things for them. And also um, just pose the question if that's kind of a dichotomous goal to um, making sure you're optimizing funding levels for all institutions because it's kind of a dichotomous thing to think about funding levels for closing the gap for the state versus your institution's mission. So I was just going to ask what those, how those would interact. Um, well, well, the state, the the recommendation is is from these committees are for statewide mm -hmm. rec, uh, formulas and statewide funding levels. Um, but we have asked them in the past to look at institutions and and look at the impact of their recommendation on individual institutions. Okay, so it's impact on institution, not on their mission statement or their their goal Correct. for their student body. Right. Okay. Oh, well, okay. part of it too, too is one of the discussions from the past, and I don't know where this one will go. Was should there be a different? Uh, some modification of the formula for those institutions that are primarily undergraduate institutions, uh, undergraduate and masters, versus those that are, you know, it's we're going to talk about them tier one or, or, or doctoral because the, the delivery systems aren't identical. There may be some difference in costs. Those that focus on uh, primarily undergraduates tend to, to have uh, staff their freshman classes with uh, tenured faculty which have different kinds of costs and, and things that could be looked at. So this could take different kinds of, of forms. Yeah, that's, I, I think you maybe just answered. I was going to say, get, you throw out a specific example, and that's a good one. You know, the, the, take Midwestern that focuses on liberal, liberal arts undergraduate mm -hmm. education. Right. You know, their needs may be different. And uh, uh, I suspect that one of the reasons we're way ahead on doctoral degrees and closing the gaps is because of the funding that comes that's right. with them. That's right. So. Um, and I think that's what we're driving at when we use the code phrase institutional mission. Okay. But that's a good question. Okay. Any other comments or questions for Gary? All right. Thanks, Gary. We'll move on to briefly, very briefly, agenda item 2I. There's no action needed on this uh, item uh, because it's going to become come before the entire board at our July meeting. Uh, it involves four proposed rule changes that resulted from legislation. And I already have a session. change to one of these <laughs> because we had a veto of SB 1343. So that was half of, rec of the rules change in two. <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, basically what that is going to do is um, if you will turn to that rule, which is the second one back. Um, the number six will stay the same, 
but the change to number one, which um, exempts hours that a student before, uh, received before an associate degree, that will be marked out. We're going to try and get it posted in time to still bring this rule to the board in July, but, um, oops, Bill's shaking his head saying there's no way we can get it posted in time. It was vetoed this weekend. And so we, we have, don't have time to get it into the Texas Register in time. So you will actually be seeing that rule change in October instead of in July. So three of these will appear before Three of those will now appear before and We'll pull this one down and repost it for October. For, vote. That's a large enough change, a substantial change. As and we're not going to go learning. through. We're not going to go through any more detail, but these. Uh, you can read through these before the July board meeting so you understand the implications they have to do with the slight modification of the top 10% rule, uh, exempt hours, uh, SB 1796, which changes the threshold of our projects to $4 million, and um, the nursing shortage reduction program. Agenda item 2J is the legislative update. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we're, we are at 12.07. You want to wait for your purposes, uh, the meeting you were going to have, and come back to this, or do you want to Let's go ahead and plow through? Plow through. Okay. Laura? Laura Weber, our Director of External Relations, will give us a review of the significant outcomes of the 81st Legislature. And they were many and varied. Good afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Don't let the notebooks intimidate you. <laughs> we just wanted to get some things organized. But a lot of it's just the, the, the overhead you're going to be seeing, uh, plus some information that you've been sent before electronically. That, but in case we needed to refer to it, I wanted to have it in one place for you. You can leave these behind when you leave or take pieces out. or We will send it again to you electronically in uh, a single format. Uh, after this meeting. I just want to know uh, which meeting we're going to get a brand new bookcase for each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's how the legislature is. It generates a lot of paper. Uh, joining me at the table is Lizette Montiel, who's our uh, assistant director for state governmental relations. She's going to be going over a few bills and also may be able to help answer questions that I can't, uh, since she was intimately involved in the session as well. Um, as soon as our presentation comes up. <laughs> She's done. We have the things here if you want to just go we'll just, Yeah, we can start without, without Catch those. Up if it comes on. Uh, in the first section, we want to give a little overview of the appropriations outcomes. Uh, the governor did uh, issue a proclamation vetoing certain items in appropriations, but they'll only have a slight impact on this. So uh, we'll get this updated, but it's not going to have uh, much of a change at all. So we're going with, with what we have here. Uh, the slide on page three shows you the uh, that the proportion of education uh, of the overall budget. Uh, it's uh, Education as a whole is 41 percent of all state appropriations, uh, and it's 59 percent of, of general revenue. So education is a huge part of uh, the state's budget overall, uh, and higher education is a large part of that as well. The slide on page four uh, gives a preliminary summary. We always refer to appropriations numbers as preliminary almost until the next session because they seem to, <laughs> we seem to find new things all the time. Uh, but the prelim preliminary uh, summary shows that the, the uh, appropriations to the coordinating board were almost a 30 percent increase, which shows the legislature's overall confidence in the coordinating board and the various funds and programs that it administers. Uh, this was a significant increase uh, given the, uh, the budgetary times that we're in. Uh, you'll note on there it's a slight loss on the federal funds. That's reflective of the uh, loss in Perkins funds that you heard about yesterday. Some of you heard about yesterday. Uh, on slide five, the financial aid funding, we, uh, we reached a landmark uh, at the coordinating board with a billion dollars, over a billion dollars in financial aid. Uh, this session. That is a significant milestone to pass. 
and it was also a significant increase of 34 uh, percent over the last biennium, so a, a great change there. Laura, I just want to say for the whole group that that is really significant. And uh, when we were in Denver, I was with, sitting with the guy that is, runs all the education for Governor Schwarzenegger in California. And when I mentioned that we're going to be giving a billion dollars in financial aid in the state and that it increased 34 percent, they're cutting financial aid in California. And most states are. In the context of the nation, this this was highly uh, remarkable. Very great vote of confidence. Yeah, that's, uh, this was our number one objective, and so I, I agree with Witt. I think we you know, can congratulate our, uh, you and your staff and, oh. and our agency for accomplishing this kind of growth in student financial aid. Well, I, I think the legislature knows that this is a high priority with the board. Uh, we'd like to take credit, but it's really the board that uh, presses on this issue and reminds the legislature that this is really the number one priority in higher education, and uh, and they listen to you. So uh, it's, it's a significant amount that we received. Uh, the Texas grant uh, saw a significant increase of 43.5 percent, uh, which will enable us to serve an additional 21,000 students. So that's a that's a great um, increase for us as well, and for the state. On be on time on slide seven, the uh, it, it, it almost doubled, increasing by 63 million dollars. Uh, of that, some of it was uh, unexpended funds from the last biennium, but it's still an increase of 35 million dollars. So a significant increase there. The uh, Texas Education Opportunity Grant increased by $10 million, not as much as the board would have liked, but uh, still uh, a significant increase. Uh, TEG and work study received level funding, so they stayed the same as they were in the last biennium. Another area that the uh, legislature uh, funded significantly was in the Professional Nursing <coughs> Shortage Reduction Program. And some of you heard about this yesterday in a meeting, so I don't want to repeat too much, but, but uh, there are different funding levels uh, for uh, funds to be distributed to the institutions that are uh, both in riders and in, and in the uh, uh, codification of the, of the statute. So I've kind of re uh, outlined some of those here for you again. <laughs> We also saw uh, increased fund funding throughout the Coordinating Board's funding strategies. Uh, many of these were impo of importance to the Coordinating Board, of course, uh, in addition to financial aid, such as Teach for Texas, the Joint Admission Medical Program, Developmental Ed, and Adult Basic Education. Uh, so on this chart, you can see where some of those funding increases took place. Within the Appropriations Act, there are always a lot of riders, uh, and these not only direct us on how to expend the funds, but all, will also have incorporated in, in them studies uh, and different uh, directions to the coordinating board. So we tried to capture just a few of these for you here. Uh, there's the special item study, uh, where the coordinating board and LBB is going to uh, study each item in the institution special item support goal. Uh, the health-related formula cost matrix study that Gary was talking about earlier, uh, directing the coordinating board to conduct a study to validate the weights in the health-related institutions formula matrix. Uh, there's the there's a report within the physician education loan repayment program on retention rates. Uh, there is the Texas, the TSTC return value funding study. Uh, that's going to be conducted in cons consultation with the Comptroller, TWC, and the TSTC system. Mm. Uh, this is a, a feasibility model based on returned value for using the formula calculations. Uh, there's the funding for non-semester length of developmental ed, which I think that Gary also mentioned uh, in his presentation, and uh, uh, also the rider on developmental ed, which appropriated the $5 million uh, for, uh, to focus on uh, best practices to, state, to implement statewide. There is the statistical analysis of predictors of college success. Uh, this will be working with the Legislative Budget Board to provide data uh, to them to uh, uh, produce reports on and analyses on uh, success in higher education. <coughs> 
and the Adult Basic Education Community College grants. I think Gary also mentioned that one, uh, the $10 million to be used to award competitive grants to community colleges uh, and public technical ed institutions. So kind of a quick overview of the appropriations. I did include in your notebook the preliminary overview in the next tab that uh, Terry Flack had sent to you earlier. Uh, just in case there were other questions or issues you wanted to discuss. Again, we will send all this to you electronically uh, after this meeting. Laura, of the billion six fifty eight in our next biennium budget, what percentage ballpark is, is trustee funds now? I don't know if I know that. Have y'all looked at that, Susan? I don't think we've looked at it yet. Um, no. But we'll well, at least a million something because that's financial aid. <laughs> right. yeah. We have about 85 percent as trustee funds, right? 85 percent? Yeah, approximately. Thanks, Arturo. Okay, great. Uh, in addition to appropriations, we there were quite a few uh, individual bills that were filed on higher education <laughs> issues. Uh, and about 115 or so of those uh, passed. And uh, we just selected a few of them to go through with you, mostly because they either affect the workload of the coordinating board, especially uh, those, uh, or have significant implications for higher education. Uh, I, I called some of these headline bills because they literally made headlines in the media as these bills were being passed. Uh, the first one is House Bill 3 uh, that relates to public school accountability curriculum and promotion requirements. Uh, this is a very lengthy bill primarily uh, directed to uh, the public education sector, uh, but it does address public school accountability and includes the transition from tax to end of course exams, which all tie into the standards for preparing students for college in the skilled workforce. So our college readiness standards are, play a very prominent part in this bill uh, and its implementation going forward. Senate Bill 175 is the top 10 percent law change and applies only to the University of Texas, who can cap their first time entering top 10 percent enrollment at 75 percent. And that's one that you saw there was the rule change, preliminary rule change right. proposed, I guess. <clears throat> right. It, and it I think as some of you heard yesterday, what it actually authorizes uh, UT is to set a, another percentage, like a 7 percent, if they think that that's going to make 75 percent of their enrollments top 10 percent. Uh, they have to let the ISDs know what that cap is, not later than September 15th of each school year, so that they can inform students and parents. There was also in this bill the uh, top 10 percent scholarship, which we had had in a rider the previous uh, session, the previous biennium, but now has been codified uh, in this bill, and funding of $21.5 million per year was provided for this scholarship. Mr. Chairman, yes. Laura, I, just one thing, I know that you've got some information back here on HB3. Um, we saw a great summary of HB3 the other day that I think was put out by uh, Texas Association of Superintendents. But We'll send that to you. I mean, to me, it's the most, it helped me to really understand what the bill says. And I'd like you to kind of look at that and tell us if it's right. And if it is, that might be something we want to include in here. Is this Fred said, or is this ours? It's good. I think that's it's ours. ours. Mm -hmm. It was produced by them, so it, from, it helped you to really understand the issue about, you know, English 3 and Algebra 2 and, you know, all in the end of course test. Yes, and, and Anyway, Mary, you probably got that. Um, actually, I'm waiting for Johnny Vasilka to uh, make a couple of updates to it, and then he'll send it to us electronically. Okay. And once he's done that, I'll send it to you. Okay, great. We, you know, any and all updates you receive on anything, <laughs> we always like to see because it helps us verify what our interpretations are, yeah. if nothing else. Uh, so we 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 uh, always like seeing other uh, bill analyses that are done by other folks. Uh, another large bill was House Bill 51, uh, which toward the end of the session started gathering up a lot of different bills uh, related to higher education. And uh, what people think of it is, is the bill that is 
to set the development of national research universities, but it had a lot of other things that got incorporated into it. It's it's a very difficult bill to work your way through. Uh, if you see any analyses on this one, we we definitely appreciate those. Uh, and the funding of it it was was very uh, complex, so we tried to work through all, all these issues. Uh, and on the next slide, especially, I was I tried to outline some of the funding. Uh, because of the different elements that were pulled into the bill. Uh, in the bill are, were the, the HEAF allocations uh, that got pulled in from another piece of legislation. That's, that's an existing uh, program. The performance incentive funding, which we had in uh, a rider in the last biennium, was pulled into this bill uh, to be codified. And the research development fund was also discussed in this bill with, with some changes to it. For new programs within the bill, the Excellence in Program Fields and Incentive Funds grants was added. There was no appropriation associated with this, but there's still uh, work for the coordinating board and the staff to do regarding setting some uh, criteria for these grants and for these and for the receipt of these funds once they are funded. Uh, there's also provisions in there to change the the HEAF, which is in the um, uh, con the Constitutional HEAF fund, into uh, the, Na the National Research University uh, Fund. If that happened, it should spin off about $70 million um, a year for that purpose, if Gary's numbers are right. <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, it also created the uh, Research University Development Fund, and there's, there was no appropriation regarding that. Uh, there was some discussion and, in fact, some people actually thought it actually happened, but it did not, that this, this would actually be a conversion of the Texas Competitive Knowledge Fund. But the Texas Competitive Knowledge Fund still exists as a separate fund, so it's, it did, that, if that was supposed to be the conversion that happened, it did not happen. Uh, the Texas Research Incentive Program, the TRIP, is really the only one that received uh, general revenue funds. Uh, this is for matching funds to uh, for certain gifts and donations at the institutions. Uh, there's been some concern that there will this that it's going to be kind of a first come first serve for the institutions. But the way I'm reading this, and I think the way the board would naturally approach this is there's going to be a process for awarding these funds to uh, get to make sure that uh, we know what the what the gifts and donations are and making sure that there's a process for that and Susan looks like she wants to say yeah, something. You will be seeing rules coming to the October board meeting. We're going to have a, a meeting with the emerging research institutions to talk about um, the whole process and how, what's going to be the easiest way to collect the information that we need and how it would be distributed, then there will be rules that come to y'all next time. So it will be coming to the September committee meeting. You know, one of our charges under this bill <coughs> is that we're the ones that charged with making recommendations on funding as part of formula recommendations. So won't this also need to be a charge to our general academic? Uh, this actually lays out in statute um, the performance funding. But it does have um, the actually it was the incentive funding, the same way that the committee recommended and how they were funded in '09. It sets out um, in statute now. Well, yeah, it says it provides for performance incentive funding, but it also makes a broader. <clears throat> there's a bullet point here with a broader comment that we mu we must make recommendations on funding as part of formula recommendations. And I assume that's. On the National Research University Fund. Oh, right. Yeah. So uh, that seems like it would impact what we talked about earlier, which is the charge formula to our charge. You know, general academic formula funding advisory committee. Maybe there needs to be a, su a subcommittee of that group that consists of the seven emerging institutions' representatives. Okay. Although I don't know that all seven were actually on that list. Well, we can do a work group. Okay. Yeah, it, it is just something that the staff is definitely in the process of trying to work their way through what needs to take place, but we just want to let folks know that a process will be developed in all of these different areas. It's not something that's just going to happen on September 1st. Well, uh, no, but this one will be under a magnifying glass. Of course, <laughs> and probably will be 
reworked a little bit in the next session, so uh, <laughs> which in a way I hope be, so we have fewer funds that have the word research fund in them because that gets, a, that gets confusing for everyone. Uh, the next headline bill I was pointing out was Senate Bill 1443, which did not pass. It was the last uh, of the uh, tuition regulation bills that was coming through the, during the session. Uh, everyone fairly, pretty much expected a tuition regulation bill to pass, uh, but, but it did not. Uh, probably, you know, as, as the appropriations process was getting closer and closer, it became apparent that the funding to the institutions would not be at a level that would uh, allow a, a, a more stringent regulation of tuition. But this will be an issue that will be revisited again. And on the last day of sessions, uh, Representative Branch passed House, House Committee Resolution 288 uh, to set some parameters on uh, tuition increases and, of course, uh, when the legislature speaks like this, everyone should listen uh, because it will it will help in the next session to uh, keep keep some uh, parameters around what happens during that session. So uh, this this bill was put into place at the very last minute. Uh, another kind of grouping of bills are those that would create new institutions in Texas. Of course, you heard from some of those folks this morning. Uh, the Senate Bill 956 creates a new law school in South Dallas for the University of North Texas system. Senate Bill 98 was the um, bill to authorize the new medical school in South Texas. These were both bills that the coordinating board did higher education impact statements on as well. Uh, Senate Bill 629 uh, removed some barriers uh, to the operation of, uh, of three four-year institutions, Texas A&M San Antonio, Texas A&M Central Texas, and the University of North Texas at Dallas. Uh, other bills of significance to the coordinating board, uh, House Bill 2425. Uh, it started off as just a bill to authorize uh, independent institutions to participate in the engineering recruitment program, but it was amended to uh, direct the coordinating board to authorize baccalaureate degrees at community colleges. Uh, it was amended again in the Senate to turn that into a study. Since we have se uh, several uh, community colleges that have baccalaureate degrees, but the coordinating board really hasn't had the opportunity to study those and see what the see what their recommendations would be for going forward with additional degrees. Uh, that, that that bill was changed to authorize that study. Uh, so that will be one of the studies that the coordinating board will need to go back to the legislature with next session. Uh, House Bill 2504 uh, required the coordinating board to prescribe standard, uniform standards intended to ensure that information regarding the cost of attendance at higher education institutions is available to the public in a manner that is consumer friendly and readily understandable. So this will be an interesting bill to uh, implement. Uh, House Bill 4471 you heard uh, about earlier regarding the professional nursing shortage reduction program. House Bill 4149 uh, requires the coordinating board to conduct a study to identify achievable cost-saving measures. Uh, they, it also requires that the, uh, uh, the estimate of the amount that would be saved during a five-year period uh, through implementation of each recommendation in this study. Senate Bill 174 establishes online institutional performance reports or resumes. We were referring to these as report cards earlier, but the <coughs> preferred terminology now is resume or performance report. Uh, we can't use the term performance report. As far as I know, that's okay. Right. Uh, makes no sense whatsoever. It, yeah, but that was that was the terminology that was changed in the bill. And one of the things that we will be working on are, are the. <coughs> one pager that you have behind each of your projects. We will use that and incorporate what is required in the statute so that there's only one out there instead of having multiple mm -hmm. things. But the first ones have to be posted by this February, so there's a short, <laughs> yeah. short leash on that one. Uh, Always. <laughs> In the area of financial aid, House Bill 518 uh, was a bill that would have uh, provided a loan repayment assistance for correctional officers, for certain speech language pathologists, and it also incorporated uh, a new 
Te Texas Teach Corps program. Uh, the governor vetoed this bill, so it is no longer uh, applicable. Uh, House Bill 2154, related to the Physician Education Loan Repayment Program, this was this was significant in increasing the funding um, for this program. Uh, they're going to be using taxes on smokeless tobacco products, uh, but it appro but the but the bill resulted in an appropriation of seven million dollars in the first year and fifteen million in the second year for the program. So this was a significant increase. Other areas in financial aid uh, with either loan repayments, scholarships, exemptions, waivers, uh, a lot of a lot of different groups are involved in these, uh, <clears throat> and there's a, there's a list of those there for you uh, that the, the staff will be bringing probably bringing rules and various changes to you at a later date on these bills. Uh, there was a, a group of bills that the staff made recommendations uh, regarding that were actually passed uh, and will be implemented, and I was going to ask uh, Lizette to cover those with you. Good afternoon. Um, in the fall, we asked the staff to submit legislative recommendations <coughs> they feel would be useful for their divisions or for the coordinating board in general. Um, HB 4149, like Laura just mentioned, by Representative Rose, uh, directs the coordinating board to perform two studies, both on cost savings and measures for institutions, and um, a study on electronic textbooks, and it should be focused on UT Austin's pilot program. Um, HB 4476 by Representative Cohen um, was recommended by the Business Support Services staff. This bill modifies the TEG grant to align its eligibility requirements with Texas grant. The new legislation is, allows students to receive awards if enrolled three quarters of the time instead of enrolling full time and allows for an award in the second year of college to be based on students' compliance with the academic progress requirements uh, that each institution sets rather than a 2.5 GPA overall. SB 1798 uh, relates to the eligibility of educational aid exemptions. Uh, exempt for the exemption program. As you know, educational aides receive exemptions. Um, this bill would allow um, the administration of the program to be changed to the institutions of higher education instead of the coordinating board. So they would determine eligibility and then coordinating board staff would then um, submit the funds appropriately to each institution. B 1729 by Senator West would change the terms for the advisory committee, uh, the students appointed to the advisory committees. They're currently uh, at a one-year term and they're changed to a two-year term. <coughs> this would allow students to have, you know, more of an opportunity to get involved in the committees and um, learn a little bit more about the processes of higher education. So. <coughs> Heather, we tried to also do that for, I don't know if you, you want to hear that or not, but after the last two days, but, uh, but we did, yeah, we still would love to see, it takes you a year to kind of get up and really understand what's going on, so. That's a huge benefit to have love, that increase. But we'd love to see maybe next session focus on the student board members also be able to have a two-year term. Yeah. No, we weren't successful this time. SB 2258 by Senator Zaffidini moves the statutory authority to carry out the intensive summer programs um, from the public education statute uh, section of the education code to the higher education section of the code. Um, because, you know, public education and higher education serve uh, different distinct student populations, staff recommended the clarification of the separate um, titles in the code. In addition, uh, the bill also allows the coordinating board to develop by rule um, higher education bridge programs in the subject of social, social science, in addition to those that already exist uh, relating to math, science, and English language arts. SB 2262 also does a um, similar thing. It changes from the public education statute to the higher education statute. It also changes the eligibility requirements that teach, teachers are, <coughs> so teachers are able to participate instead of it being five years, it's two years to give them the opportunity to improve their instructional skills. 
And that concludes our staff recommendations that actually, you know, went through the process and were signed by the governor. They don't, they don't sound like much, but I can't tell you how many times Lizette had to go rescue these bills uh, because they, they would get stalled or something would happen. Uh, and uh, so she, she did a great job of making sure that we were always on top of them, wherever they were and whatever was happening to them, uh, and, and got quite a few through. Uh, looking ahead uh, into the next <coughs> session, you've been doing that a, a bit today already. Uh, we do have, of course, coming up, the, uh, the standing legislative committees will be getting their interim charges and probably starting to meet in uh, early January, I would suspect. So one of them ha has already asked us for uh, recommendations on what the charges should be. Not that they, all, they have total control of that, but they can make suggestions on what the, the charges to their committee should be. Uh, and we added those into the slide here that the, the staff had, uh, had suggested to this committee. Uh, but we, we expect to be involved with all of these committees going forward, plus the, um, any other special committees or work groups that might be um, created during, during the interim. The, uh, in the next slide, I, I went ahead and uh, captured the, the board's priorities regarding the comprehensive funding strategy that we were working on last session. Uh, I think all these elements are still uh, alive and well, and, and we should keep keep pursuing them. Uh, it was good to capture this into a kind of a succinct message like this. If, if the board is having other issues that they would like to see, we, we would like to be able to do that as well. The earlier the better. Uh, one thing we found was adopting, you know, trying to, trying to incorporate uh, recommendations that the board just adopted in November into a session that was starting in January was very difficult. Uh, can't be helped sometimes, I know, but it just makes, makes it more difficult when, when that's the case. So uh, the earlier the better is always the mantra. And my thought there is that we'll, you know, the strategic planning session, that'll be a major that'll part of what we're doing is right. policy issues, legislative issues, and trying to get way out in front of it. So. We'd like to, to have, uh, you know, all of, as much of 2010 and maybe all of 2010 leading up to the 11th session plow the ground, which we didn't have this last time. And, um, you know, I think you, this is a good summary slide because we had more than one member tell us that tuition re-regulation, which ultimately didn't pass, the discussions on modifying the top 10 percent rule and the tier one legislation, that those three issues really sucked all the wind out of uh, higher education, except for uh, the major success in increasing uh, funding, not just for the agency, but particularly for student financial aid. So, you know, I think we made a big gain in the dollars this session, and it's, so it's these tactical or strategic changes in policy that we want to achieve success with next session. And uh, I'm sure we'll probably add some to this list, but I'm sure. these are still kill need plus merit, uh, completed hours, performance funding. Those are all still key strategies that we need to pursue. Any questions uh, for Laura? Um, Brad, I just one one comment. I just say, and I, I know you join me in this. Um, it, it was really, um, um, I hate to say, inspirational. I, mean, I don't know if you ever want to. You, how often you want to go through the session? But uh, really, to Laura, to Mark, to Lizette, to Linda, uh, to Raymond, Terry, <laughs> Terry, uh, Terry uh, who's not with us, but. Uh, today she's on vacation, permanent vacation. Um, but I will tell you, it was it was a really honor and a privilege to work with y'all and to watch you because it's it's amazing the amount of work and not just them. They're the ones at the Capitol, but it's all the people back here in the agency that are they're on the phone calling people in the agency saying, "Give me these numbers. I need them now." And um, and especially for people like Fred and I when we testify and we. You know, we were asking questions about up to about a minute before we went in there, you know. So uh, I just want to really commend all of y'all. Y'all just did a great job. And it was uh, it was fun and it was challenging and pretty inspirational to watch all of you. So Exhausting. It was awesome. <laughs> thanks to each of you. If I, I mean if I can add a thanks to the staff here because 
they are incredible uh, about supporting this whole effort. And I hear from other agencies, or I hear from legislative members that other, you know, that the agencies are not that responsive. And it's all due to the folks here that are just behind us all the way uh, because we ask a lot. Yeah, so. they're scrambling. Oh, I didn't mean to leave Bill Franz out. He was always giving us legal advice what to say and <laughs> what not to say. So. Keep us out of trouble. Well, it's uh, it's telltale when the emails are, are uh, sent at 10 o'clock at night and 1 in the morning that uh, it, the level of work and focus and intensity is going on. So I second Witt's comments and, and appreciation. And last but not least, we have one more informational item. David had to leave for a stimulus funding meeting. So Susan is going to give us a quick update on a very related topic, and that is the federal stimulus funds for education. Yes. Um, in the appropriations, Article 12 was the one that deals with the, stimulation, uh, the stimulus funding. Um, in that, the <clears throat> higher ed got approximately $220 million out of and what they did is they substituted in, um, and it's not a substitute because it can't be a substitute. It is. Um, 81 million went to the general academic formula funding, 51 million goes into the health related formula funding, and 15 million goes into community college formula funding, and 80 million um, goes into the incentive funding for the coordinating board to which gets allocated out to all of the institution well to the general academic institutions except for the state colleges <clears throat> then there are some institutions that received and i can send you this list or for article 12 um, some of the institutions get varying amounts of money on a line item and the, all of the money for higher ed came out of the um, what they call the general services amount, which is the $723 million that the governor received for allocating out. And that is how that got it. The $3.2 billion all went to public ed. So um, really, <clears throat> Tom and I actually did some adding. I think it's $319 million or $329 million total went to higher ed. And that includes that. Um, part of what David is actually going to be talking about at the governor's office today includes how the institutions, what type of report, reporting requirements will come along with those funds. Is this, can we can we characterize this as a final answer? <laughs> Stimulus. As far as I know, this is the final answer. <laughs> I'm getting hand signals over there from yeah. Tom and Gary. <laughs> we, we think. We think well, this is the final answer. We've been asked over and over to run things multiple ways, and um, we think this is the final answer. Okay. We're working on the application and helping the governor's office with numbers for the application. We sent them some more numbers yesterday. Part of that's based on what we received in the past and what we received from this biennium. And of course, then, as Laura knows, with the competitive knowledge fund, did that go here? Did that go there? And, so it's been kind of a moving target up until now. But we think we have the final. It's as dynamic as anything in the legislative <coughs> session. It was. It kept, it was definitely a moving target. Any other questions regarding the federal stimulus fund? The only thing that, you know, we might just want to up for the other committee members is I think you had noted that 80 was for general academics, 50 for health related. Health related and 17, 15. 15. That, that adds up to Fred can can do that in his head, but I don't know what 137, 140 million is. What we got to understand is that came out of the stimulus funds, and that's part of the formula, and that's yeah. great concern for us because mm -hmm. when we go into next session, in terms of those funds being included in the baseline, that's a real challenge we've got to keep in front of everybody uh, we'll for have the to institution. Continually so. remind the legislature that. Because they put those funds into, and then they took them out of from general revenue, maintaining what they had um, used in '09, what was had been appropriated for formulas in '09. <clears throat> so that is something that we're going to really have to work on, because from early indications, the 12, 13 biennium is not going to be any easier than this one. Yeah. So that's going to be a. Hence the need for her earlier preparation of our messages and our priorities. That's right. That's Any right. further comments or questions on this information? 
If none, the chair will definitely entertain a motion to adjourn. <laughs> so moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second by Brenda. All in favor, stand up and leave the table. All right. <laughs>